We'll give it one more second to we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Infection Control at Work. The risk, stop, know the risk, stop the spread of infections in tribal health care. I'm Courtney Wheeler. I'm a public health program manager here at the National Indian Health Board. Oh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I do want to mention this session is being recorded, and we ask that if you don't consent to being recorded, that you hop off at this time. Before we start the presentations, there's a few housekeeping items I would like to go over. We ask that you remain muted during the presentations unless the presenters ask you to engage. You can use the chat box for any questions that you may have or any comments. If there are any technology issues, please reach out to myself or me now, Dr. Ron. We will be on here to help you with at any time. And also as a reminder, please make sure you complete the post-institute evaluation. We will save um, question and answer portion to after um, Dr. Abby's presentation. Next slide, please. So the National Indian Health Board was created by the tribes 50 years ago to advocate for improved health. NIC is the only national organization of its kind in all federally recognized tribes and advocated on all other services, and I provide policy analysis and real time applications to tribes throughout Indian country. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, it seems, um, we lost the audio for a second there. Okay. The focus was in partnership with members of the Area Indian Health Board and in places where no board exists within the tribes. In that region. Courtney, we can't hear you well, very well. No, we can't. Uh, can you guys hear me okay now? Yes. 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 Okay, awesome. We'll just go to the next slide, please. Okay, so today we will have an overview of Project First Line from CDC as well as NIAC. Um, Dr. Abby Carlson um, from CDC will present on where germs live and thrive in healthcare. We'll have a brief break, and after that, we will talk about the importance of infection control in tribal healthcare, followed by managing COVID 19, what's next. And at the end, we'll have a chat to talk about. Um, Infection control in tribal health care, where we are, um, issues that have arisen during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as well as trainings and resources and tools that are needed and lessons learned. I will now turn it over to Kendra Cox from the Center for Disease Control. Kendra is the lead writer for content creation for CDC's Project First Line. She has served as a technical and creative writer editor across many CDC centers and divisions since 1996. She has been with the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion since 2016 with Project Science since its beginnings. Please welcome Kendra Cox. Thank you so much, Courtney. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to say hello to all of you and to provide a brief overview of Project First Line to lead into the activities of the day, which are look incredibly exciting for everyone. So I won't dilly-dally, I'll go ahead and get started and just say thank you and welcome on behalf of the entire Project First Line team. We love partnering with all of our partners and uh, NIHB is very special to us and we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Today, I will give you a brief overview of Project First Line. What is it? Who are we? And then a very quick look at some of our tools, resources, and content that are out there for you to take advantage of. And then when my friend and colleague, Dr. Carlson, 
gives her, her talk a little bit later, she'll dive into a, some more of the details about how we look at infection control in healthcare and what it really means. First, uh, the standard disclosures. I have no relevant financial relationships with anyone, to be honest, <laughs> and I do not intend to discuss any unapproved use of any products or devices. One of the things we like to start off with is to say, why are we here? Why, what, why are we here? Well, we're here because healthcare infection control. What is it? It is the answer to a question that seems simple, but is incredibly complicated and something we struggle with daily in healthcare, which is how do we keep people from getting sick when they come to us for healthcare? And how do we keep ourselves who are providing the healthcare from getting sick? That's what healthcare infection control is, and that's what we're here to do. So project first line, who are we? Well, it all started, <laughs> it started a long time ago, actually, but what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm not saying anything any of you don't know, but the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted longstanding gaps, many longstanding gaps in healthcare and healthcare delivery. For Project First Line, it really showed these gaps in infection control knowledge and practice in healthcare settings. And, and the gaps were a function of many things. Um, disparities in infection control expertise in the workforce, structural gaps in infection control training and education and access to it, a lack of understanding of how healthcare workers learn, how they need to learn, how they want to learn, how they can get access to educational material. A really interesting aspect is this framing of infection control, a checklist, a rule someone has to follow, a protocol to which someone has to ad adhere. And Project First Line wanted to take infection control out of that, out of that checklist and into a way that healthcare workers incorporate it into their daily lives. So infection control isn't just a checklist. It is actions that we take, certainly, but it's at, those actions are part of systems that we put into place for infection control to be successful. And those systems are part of this culture of shared responsibility of every person in that healthcare facility being part of the infection control team. And the actions, systems, and culture work together to keep people from getting sick. When we think about education and training, we see opportunities to make a difference at the action level, at the systems level, and at the culture level of a healthcare facility and of systems writ large. And this is where Project First Line is coming from, is a, a, a total holistic approach to infection control. Project First Line in, in a nuts and bolts fashion is a national training and education collaborative. The collaborative is a critical part of who Project First Line is because we have a number of partners, a large number of partners and a large number of healthcare workers and everyone works together to increase infection control knowledge and understanding among the frontline healthcare workforce. The people who are on the ground every single day, getting their hands dirty, <laughs> and then performing hand hygiene appropriately right after, helping people get better and helping to keep people from getting sick. And Project First Line is committed to providing clear and effective resources and education on infection control that reflect adult learning expertise, educational best practices, to get at that gap I mentioned before in being able to reach these frontline healthcare workers, reaching you frontline healthcare workers where you are, reaching folks and giving them the knowledge that they need that they can put into place to keep themselves and everyone else they come into contact with safe. And the, the education and training is 
always, always grounded in CDC's infection control recommendations and the science that informs them. So when I talk about a collaborative and I talk about partners, we have a number of partners. Here are our clinical healthcare partners that you see on this, on this slide. I won't take the time to read them to you, but you see a number of names you can may- you, Can you- and Yes. Your slides aren't showing. You, your slide presentation isn't sharing. <laughs> what is showing? Nothing, just you speaking. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh. let me come back to the Zoom and see what on earth might have happened. Oh, it just decided to stop sharing. That's fascinating. Wow. All righty, let me see what's happening here. I apologize. Everybody. We can see them now, Kendra. Thank you. Oh, good. We're good. Wonderful. Everything looks crazy on my end, but if it looks good to you, that's all that matters. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I can't, there we go. All right. So these are the clinical and healthcare partners. And on the next slide, you will see one you recognize, a familiar partner name, our public health partners, including NIHB and 64 health departments that are supported by CDC's Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Cooperative Agreement. So that includes, that includes state health departments and others. We also have a number of academic partners who are doing really interesting research in infection control, education and training, finding more of those gaps, finding more of those areas of need so that Project First Line can address them. One of the important parts of Project First Line is the focus on frontline healthcare workers so that the tools and resources that are going out are getting people, getting to people effectively. And so in listening to healthcare workers, we learn more every single day. We learn more every single hour that we hear from our partners and frontline healthcare workers. But some of the things we have really heard and tried our best to respond to are the understanding that COVID-19 resulted in burnout, trauma, exhaustion among our audiences. And, and we also understand and appreciate that every healthcare worker has a role to play in infection control, every single person in the building. In tied into that idea is wanting to work with what motivates healthcare workers? What motivates you to practice infection control, to keep yourself safe, your coworkers, your patients, all of these motivations come into play with Project First Line. And in speaking about the, the thinking that health, that infection control in healthcare is just a, a list that you have to go through. What, what we wanna do with Project First Line and what our partners are so helpful in doing is getting across this message, not just what to do, but why you're doing it. To tap into those motivations, but also to make the infection control actions that might seem like a checklist become second nature. We have content that is tailored to the practice setting so that, again, we can reach people where they are so that they can put that information to use immediately. And with that in mind, the content, we have longer content, but a lot of it is more bite-sized so that our, our workers and supervisors and trainers can fit, fit education into their already cram jam fold busy day. There's reinforcement so that our, our learners, our audiences instill, have confidence in what they do, but are also reminded that they should be confident in what they do. They are professionals and they know what to do and when to do it. We're also focused on in meeting people where they are, in meeting language and literacy level needs. So it's not, a quest, it's not just a question of how much time in the day do you have, it's how, how are these messages going to reach you? How, do you? how do you learn and how can we fulfill that need? 
I'll take a quick moment just to show you a very brief taste of our tools, resources, and content. This is our homepage where there are links available to learn more about infection control in healthcare. Learn more that's specific to COVID-19, to explore the partnerships and even opportunities to download educational resources for yourself or your workplace and to earn continuing education. One of the really exciting things we have is this paradigm, this new way, it's not a new way, this way of thinking about healthcare infection control. Dr. Abby is going to get into these ideas in her presentation, so I won't dwell on them now. But we did want you to at least have a look-see at what the sort of resources we have that are available. These web pages dive into infection control, the different places where germs live and thrive in healthcare, and what you can do about it. We also have interactive web-based scenarios that Anyone can do any time. They are optimized for use on a mobile phone or on a tablet so that they are friendly for all the different ways people access these sorts of materials. Or you can, you can walk through a, a, a scenario in which there is a risk for germs to spread and you decide what to do in this, in this brief but jam-packed scenario. We also have these training toolkits that I know some folks have taken advantage of. And these are intended to be out of the box ways for anyone to engage in infection control training in their workplace. So we have modifiable slide sets. So we even have scripts. We have it very interesting interactive ways to engage with learners so that the information that they're getting, they're putting to use right away. So these toolkits are really a, a very exciting thing that Project First Line has put out that we are quite proud of and we hope you take advantage of. So with that, I will say thank you again on behalf of Project First Line. We are so excited to be here and so excited to hear what everyone has to say. And speaking of people with things to say, I will turn over the virtual microphone to Carmen to take it to the next step. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Kendra. Let me go ahead and queue up my slides here. Okay, bear with me just one moment. I'm trying to, having a little bit of freezing issues, but it should come up here, really. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, thank you, Moniz. So, hi and welcome everyone. My name is Carmen Sanders. I'm a member of the Macaw Tribe and I'm a public health project coordinator with the National Indian Health Board. I am the project lead for our NIHB's Project First Line. We're excited to share information about what we're doing on, and we're, what we're working on for Project First Line. Um, my colleague, Courtney Wheeler, is also with us today to assist and she works on the project as well. Okay, and so as Kendra mentioned, we, um, the Project First Line is a partnership with many organizations and NIHB is very grateful to be one of the um, many partners working with the CDC on Project First Line. And um, the, we're happy with all the resources that Project First Line offers and we're, that we're able to collaborate with the 
partner organizations and um, create and assist in, um, assist in creating the resources for infection control for frontline healthcare workers and in infection control professionals. Okay, so NIHB and Project for Sign, um, as I mentioned, we're grateful for the partnership and our goal with Project First Line for NIHB is to work with the CDC and other training partners to develop and adapt um, existing information products to help us inform tribal healthcare professionals about the important, important elements of infection control. And um, a lot of the things that topics and things that we work on for Project First Line, we NIHB, we do get them directly from feed up, feedback from tribes. So um, we're, we're here working for you and um, anything that the tribes ask us um, for infection control resources and products, we're, we're grateful to be able to work on creating those resources. So here's some of the um, opportunities that NIHB has available in support of Project First Line. We have a scholarship, um, steering committee, sub-award funding, online self-paced learning modules, job aids, um, an infectious disease threat hub, and this Infection Control Institute, as well as webinars. We're excited for the scholarship opportunity that's available. We have funding um, to assist tribal infection control staff and healthcare workers to complete courses that help improve the ability to prevent infections. We have awarded um, scholarships for three tribal infection control professionals so far, and um, they are using the funds to, um, for, to complete infection control training courses. Um, awardees also have the opportunity or the opportunity to complete um, online courses through the APIC or Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Um, There's several courses available there. Um, and we also can use the scholarship funding to pay for exam fees to complete the CBIC exam or recently we've expanded the funding to complete the CDIPC exam. So since the beginning of the project, we have heard a lot of feedback from tribes um, expressing that there is a need for infection control training resources in the tribal dental community. So we're happy to be able to expand this book scholarship to include um, dental infection control. I also wanna mention that the Scholarship funding isn't limited to the APIC courses. There are other resources for infection control training that you know of that would be helpful for your job. We do encourage you to apply for the scholarship. Um, we believe that providing the scholarship opportunity will enhance the important work that you do for your tribe and tribal healthcare organization. Uh, well, the application, it can be found on the um, files tab of the session page here. And also, you can also reach out if you have any questions about applying for the scholarship. We're accepting applications on a rolling basis and we'll continue, continue accepting applications. Okay, so we have recently, um, we're providing sub-award funding to assist tribal healthcare organizations to develop and implement infection control training within their facilities. Um, the advantage of providing the sub-award funding is that awardees can develop training tools that meet their specific needs for their staff in the, for infection control training. Some of the activities awardees are planning are include creating the job aids, hosting local webinars, and having staff members complete the CBIC or CDIPC exams, and um, some are also purchasing books and training materials that they can um, conduct infection control training in, at their facilities. The goal of offering the sub-award funding is 
to assist tribes at a local level, which supports the effort for the prevention of current and future infection, infectious disease outbreaks within tribal communities. So, and we're also continuing to work on creating some interactive learning modules. The modules are quick learn training tools that um, can be available to be taken on multiple devices that can be, we're using the articulate um, platform to create the, create the modules and they can be accessed on a PC or a tablet or even a phone. And, um, Topics again are we the topics for all of the training materials that we create within IHB comes directly from feedback from tribes who reach out to us and explain and express the topics that they'd like to hear more about or um, we really are interested in meeting the um, the needs of the tribes for infection control training and some uh, some of the modules that we are working on is source control, um, safe practices to prevent needle sticks. And um, the modules are created using a slide format and with videos embedded in them. And once they're complete, they'll have um, some question and answer and, and really more interactive. And once they're complete, those will be posted online on our Project First Line webpage. <coughs> Okay, so NHB, we are currently working on some job aids for frontline staff. Um, some of the topics uh, that we have are what is infection control. So we have some basic infection control topics um, that um, that can be either just printed out as handouts or they can be a poster size. And then we have um, our hand hygiene job aid that will be completed soon and ready. Um, or print out, um, uh, you, they can be requested for us to print out and send to you, or they can be printed out directly from uh, online. But we have uh, an information, there'll be like a fact sheet informational, but they'll have some, some call outs and pull outs where it will be just a, a graphic of um, information that can be posted. That might be just kind of a more, a smaller snippet of of that, the, of the job aid that will be, that can be posted on the wall or on a poster. And the job aids are intended for healthcare workers to use to, to reinforce um, some of the foundational infection control trainings that are practiced regularly on the job and, you know, as part of the, the daily um, part of your job, but, I'm sorry, I'm freezing just a little bit. I think um, it's on my presentation, but I think Zoom seems to be working. So, but again, the topics are decided based on feedback from tribes and also using the tools with the, uh, the project, overall project for slime training materials. And we are we have our project first line web page available, um, but NHB we're also working on creating an infectious disease threats in Indian Country Hub, and this will serve as a central location for information, resources, news, and events related to infection prevention and control, infectious disease, um, emergency response and the unique elements that contribute to protecting tribal communities. The hub will highlight tribally driven resources and maybe um, and other resources that may be featured where tribal specific ones are not known to exist. So we're really excited. We have NHB has um, several projects that are, are related to each other, um, especially in the infectious diseases and um, topics. So we're happy to put that in one central location and have all the information available for both. Okay, 
if we have, um, we had in the previous year, we've hosted several webinars and um, learning community webinars, which are also, the recordings are also available on our Project First Line webpage. Um, we are planning some upcoming webinars um, for an infection control learning community. Um, some of the topics that we have for that are, um, again, what is infection control? So we'll go back to some basic information about infection control and healthcare and, um, We'll have a webinar on focusing on variants because um, you know, variants of COVID-19 are still a concern and, um, and, and we foresee it continuing to be a concern. And then it, we'll focus on reinforcing a lot of the practices that and continue continuing the practices that we know work. And um, We'll also have some listening sessions, uh, webinars, and the listening sessions will focus on um, really information sharing and, dis and having discussions between um, tribal healthcare facilities and, um, and provide a platform for networking and just learning about the success stories for tribal healthcare. Um, in response to COVID-19 and other infection control, um, other infection control responses, um, and also moving forward and not necessarily limiting it to COVID-19, but um, just the practices and learning of the resources available and um, identifying gaps in the resources and see where we can plan ahead and where NIHB can um, assist with addressing the gaps. Yeah, it's a little slow in advancing my slides, but here we go. And so that brings us to our Infection Control Institute. This Infection Control Institute is part of Project First Line, and we're glad that you've joined us today. And we'll begin the infection uh, Institute presentations on where germs live and thrive in healthcare settings and how we keep them from spreading. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Abby. Oops. Possibly. Let me, I'm going to stop sharing and see. Hello, everyone. Let's see if we can get these slides up. Uh, Carmen, are oh, there you good? Go. Yes. All right. Just making sure. Let's... Yeah, I'm sorry. My my screen went blank for a second there. I think I'm I'm back up again. I don't. I think you guys can see me, but my screens went blank. <laughs> oh no! Yes, we can see you and hear you. You are good. Uh, all right. All right, how do the slides look, everybody? Are we in presentation mode? Great. Awesome. Let me just get all of this up so I can see what's going on. All right, thank you, as always, to Carmen and the team at NIHB for having us here. Hopefully this will be a uh, a good overview of some of the things that you will see in the Project First Line materials that Kendra so uh, wonderfully outlined earlier. I am um, going to go through this. Please don't hesitate to ask questions, but also don't hesitate to save them if you would prefer. We are going to have uh, a big question and answer session uh, at the end of this. And then again, I think later on. Um, Oh, and, and so I'm gonna uh, answer the question in chat right now about uh, people who are interested in infection control and would the APIC opportunity be most appropriate? Actually, Carmen, I think that one is for you. Do you wanna hold that till the question and answer? Do you wanna answer that now? Sure, I can answer them now if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Carlson. Sure. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, after I quit sharing, then I, I can see the questions. And um, for 
Natalyn, are the scholarships related to position or income? They are related to position. So it, um, they do focus for tribal health care. So anybody working in a, a, either a frontline professional or, or in infection control for a tribal organization. So it looks like Courtney already answered that one, sorry. And then, then. Sorry to hold up oh, the sure. presentation. I can wait until and give more context in the Q&A session. I, I mean, section that's I put, I don't know if it was the most appropriate, but I didn't know we had a Q&A session. So maybe I can just hold off onto that question until. Um... You're totally good. You're totally okay. good. Carmen, it's up to you. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think we're we're pretty open with the open discussion, so I can answer really quick. And okay. um, yes, the scholarship is available for CHWs and CHRs. Um, and if if um, as long as the courses are in, related to infection control for them. It, as we mentioned, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the APIC courses, but anything related to any courses that would be relevant for their job and focus on infection control. So does that mean, um, so I, I oversee a community health program um, in the urban area, in urban areas. And so, um, that's one thing with, you know, COVID there's just, we have, um, we have several CHRs, uh, actually about seven of them and they, you know, a handful of them, probably about four of them are really have been COVID specific and really working in that. And they're interested in, in doing more in, in infection control. So that's my question. Like what would be the most appropriate because <clears throat> several of them actually out of the seven, only two have their bachelor's degree and the mm -hmm. others are just, you know, um, starting in this, but it's a really high interest and they just want to be able to give them some resources to, to fuel that again, too, it's in the urban area. So it's not a, a tribal program. <clears throat> so I don't know if that would be, but they are all, um, tribally affiliated and working with our native community. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, if you want to reach out to me, we can go over um, research that a little more to find out what courses would be the most appropriate. Okay, thank you for that. I will. Sure. Okay, Dr. Carr. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. We're very flexible, everybody. So please feel free um, to, you know, type in the chat. We'll stop for questions at any time. This is made to answer the things that you need answered. Uh, so please don't hesitate to, to use it as you need. So uh, we're going to look at where germs live. Uh, the subtitle here in the classic academic way is examining reservoirs in healthcare. And I, this is a is a lecture that is designed to introduce you to how Project First Line is, um, is viewing our, our material in this second year. What I mean by that is we have a framework that we've developed to help people, particularly healthcare workers in healthcare spaces, think about infection control. It is a very general model, that is, is for sure. And so it may seem like there's a lot of, um, how do I wanna say? There is a lot of high level thinking here without a lot of specifics. That's on purpose. And it is just the beginning of what we are, are going to do. But my hope is that by the end of this hour, you will have some understanding of that framework that we use and, and have an opportunity to start to think about how that framework can be applied within infection control. So that as you see our materials, you'll have context for where, where we're coming from and how you can use these materials with the healthcare workers that you are involved with in our training. All right. So the usual, I have 
no financial relationships with anybody other than the government who pays my salary. And uh, there's no uh, discussion of commercial products and devices that are unapproved or uh, in investigative use. Brief agenda, we're gonna do uh, welcome and introductions. We're gonna talk about reservoirs, what they are, how we or order them in the healthcare space, and then moving from there into recognizing risk and linking this idea of risk and reservoirs and how those two can be used to really actually give people a way to think about infection control. And then we'll, sorry, then we are going to bring it all together with a little bit of reflection and then uh, conclude with some key points and some resources for how you can keep in touch with us on the CDC side. So with the welcome and introductions, I would love it if you guys could in the chat say, you know, where you are from and what kind of healthcare spaces you work in. And if you don't work in healthcare spaces, what are your interests in coming to this institute? Um, what, what about your work made you think this is where I want to be? We want to spend our time here. Uh, and I thank you at this moment for coming with us. I know there's a lot of other demands in your day and a lot of other wonderful activities happening as part of this, uh, this um, Tribal Public Health Summit. So if you could go ahead and type your name uh, in, in the chat and uh, who you are, what your interest is, what healthcare setting you work in or other setting you work in. My, I'm Abigail Carlson. I am an infectious diseases physician by training. I am also a healthcare epidemiologist by training and work here at the CDC. I've worked here since September 2020. So um, since sort of the early, early pandemic, early mid pandemic uh, and on Project First Line. And prior to that, I was an infection control physician, a clinically practicing infection control physician and infectious diseases physician at the St. Louis VA and Washington University in St. Louis. Um, all right, so Chelsea, thank you. We've got the Northern California full medical dental vision services, health promotion and education, that's wonderful. I'm glad you're here. Uh, anybody else want to share in the chat? So, Sonrisa, ah, COVID-19 public health, great. Clinical nurse at Denver Health, welcome you guys. Robin, thank you. Um, great, so actually a broad range of settings here. Great, Chief Public Health Officer, great. Wonderful, thank you everybody. Community-based, got that. Public Health Service at Winslow Indian Healthcare Center, welcome. And Infection Preventionist, welcome. Right. Senior Center, excellent. So that's an excellent, great. Diversity of, uh, of experiences and diversity of needs. So as you go through this, I think just judging by what you, are, what you all are saying about your roles and where you work and who you are, think of this as a training that you might give your own community of practitioners, so your own healthcare workers. It is probably going to be a little advanced for the level that you're at, but it, you may not have heard of this paradigm before. In fact, it's likely you've never seen infection control prevented, uh, presented quite this way. So don't hesitate to ask questions and think through things for yourself in order to better understand it. So when you go back out into your own clinics and environments that you have a, a grasp of, of what Project First Line is viewing and how it, it sees the world, because it can be very unique. All right, so we're gonna talk about reservoirs and we're gonna start quickly with the definition of a reservoir for epidemiology purposes and, and, um, uh, and Project First Line purposes. Those of you who have studied epidemiology in the past probably recognize reservoir as this, uh, as this a place where a pathogen lives, right? Where in our simple definition, we say places where germs live. So we talk about reservoirs and hosts in classical epidemiology. 
Here we're using the term reservoir again, uh, but really focusing in on reservoirs in the healthcare system and using this very simple concept of if a germ lives there, if it spends its time there, if it colonizes or other, otherwise occupies that place when it causes infection, that's a reservoir. It's just a place containing germs that can spread. So first activity, <laughs> now that we've got the chat going, if you are thinking through that definition of reservoirs, of places where germs live, and you're thinking about the human body or the environment in healthcare, what kinds of places do you, are reservoirs to you? What kinds of places do you think of where you say germs live there? Um, if you wanna write it in the chat, uh, if you want to come off mute, feel free to raise your hand and, and we can have a conversation as well. But beds, so beds and pillows, great. Hands, great. What other reservoirs? This is fantastic. Cars, all right, cars. Uh, Tracy, tell me more about what you're thinking about with the car as being your reservoir, because I'm very interested in this. Sinks, great. Sinks are reservoirs. Warm refrigerators. <laughs> right, or unrefrigerated things for sure. Ah, so transporting clients, great. Okay, that makes, makes total sense. I get where you're going with that. So the car itself, as germs are in the car uh, where patients interact with the car. Pets, I actually had to write a policy for a facility dog once um, when I was at the VA, they actually had a dog for the long-term care center. Uh, and so pets are a reservoir for sure, wildlife. Um, yeah, let me tell you about the time at an unnamed hospital when I uh, photographed a raccoon walking down the hallway. Children, always, kids are always, always, always. Uh, hands in school desks, great. Okay, these are wonderful. There's a few themes that, that are coming through. So even with pets and kids, these, these bodies, our reservoirs, right? Including ourselves. And that's, so we're gonna go through body reservoirs and the, there are a variety of different body reservoirs that we like to think of. A lot of you are mentioning a lot of wonderful, wonderful high touch surfaces. That's a common term that we use. And you can think of those surfaces as essentially dry surfaces. They, are, they vary in some important ways, but overall those surfaces generally have the same basic characteristics when we talk about dry surfaces. So when we talk about escalator handrails, bed rails, which by the way, are the most touched item in a patient's room. Um, this, has been, this has been studied and it is amazing how many times people touch bed, bed rails. Even when we think about linens, pillows, et cetera, those are all actually dry surfaces. Someone mentioned sinks and bathrooms here, Nancy, you also mentioned. Those we would classify as wet surfaces. And so we'll talk about wet surfaces and dry surfaces along with some of these body, um, body reservoirs. And then we'll go into some other, uh, some other reservoirs we don't think about quite as much but that are extremely important in healthcare epidemiology, in infection control, and how that, how that works. So this has been great. Thank you guys. All right, keep your, keep your chats available because we're gonna have lots of chatting during this presentation. So the four body reservoirs, we're gonna walk through these uh, in detail. Oops, sorry about that. In detail, but to start off, I just wanna, to tell you the four that we primarily focus on in infection control. The skin, which many of you had hands on your list, we expand that to include much of the skin. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about, about the skin as a general concept, but you're right that our focus is on the hands. More than anything else, our hands are our major interactors with the environment and a major spreader of things. Then we talk about the GI system. 
Um, and I will share one of my favorite facts about the GI system in this presentation. So you can await that with bated breath uh, and, and how the GI system really contributes to uh, disease in the healthcare setting. Respiratory system, which given COVID-19, we are all very familiar with. And then blood, which is a common one, but we have some different ways that we like to think about it beyond just thinking about needle sticks and, uh, and considering it as a reservoir in healthcare. There are some that are not here. So for example, you don't see uh, genitourinary gynecologists uh, unite to say, <laughs> what, about, what about the GU system? And it, it definitely is important. It's extremely important and also has a contribution. Uh, but for this year, for this, this set of teaching products that we wanted to create, in order to kind of keep things structured and simplified, we chose the four most common. There are others, GU being the most, uh, the next thing that most people think about, but there are a few other places that germs live in the body. We've sort of set those as special um, uh, subspecialist kind of cases, and we will be addressing those slowly as they come up in the process of, of our work. So let's talk about skin first. So as you all pointed out, the skin, especially the hands, interacts with our environment on a daily basis. It is the way that we, uh, that we make our way through the world is through our hands. Healthcare worker hands, the number of bacteria on healthcare worker hands has been measured uh, and it is highly variable depending on where you are measuring it. But if you think about one square centimeter of the palm, which is you know less than a postage stamp size, very small, anywhere from 3,400 bacteria to 4 million bacteria can be in that space. That means that the hands can have a billion or more bacteria on them, depending on where you're measuring, how big, how big your hand is, that sort of thing. But hands can be very, very filled with pathogens. When you think about pathways and pathways in our in our Project First Line world are the way we talk about transmission, how things spread. The pathways onto and off of skin really are twofold. One is through touch, right? That is, that is the most common pathway in and, in and out of skin. But there's also breaking down or bypassing the body's defenses. And what do we mean by that? We mean, that skin is part of your immune system, that it protects you from the microbes of the outside world. And there's a lot in healthcare that we do to break the skin down. So we insert IVs, we do finger stick glucose, glucoses. We, uh, we might even do things like scratch tests, which are a breakdown of the skin. We also do things that may not seem like they're a bypass or a breakdown, but the way they work uh, breaks down the skin. So a great one, it, as an example, is giving steroids. If you're on prednisone or dexamethasone, one of the things that you'll know from, from your clinical experience is that it makes skin thin and it makes skin fragile. And so not only are people more susceptible to infection because their immune system is suppressed. So another body defense going down, but also they have thinner skin and that skin is more likely to rip, tear, um, uh, or even have micro cracks or breaks. All of that is what we mean by breaking down or bypassing the body's defenses. It's any weakness in this grand, um, holistic view of our immune system that is there to protect us from, from germs, from microbes. So you can think very creatively about what it means to break down or bypass. This is a huge, huge pathway in healthcare uh, and one that we, we really wanted to bring out and is unique to healthcare. It's not one that you see in most any other field when you're talking about transmission of microbes. So. Now, 
thinking about the skin, thinking about what we just said about how the germs come on and off the skin, how things happen through the skin. I want you to think for a moment about the actions that you take to stop transmission from the skin. Think about the things that you can do to prevent germs from spreading onto the skin or off of the skin, but particularly off in this case. And I want you to go ahead and put in the chat things that you think about that you do. Tracy, you're, you're on the ball, hand washing 100%, hand washing and other ways of cleaning your hands. Danita and Tracy both add gloves. So hand washing and gloves. What else? Ex excellent. Those are the first things I would hope you would think of. So I'm glad they are there. Not shaking hands. So this is a, it's a very cultural one, right? This is a very um, difficult one that we had in the pandemic. This is, is, is the, our natural way in, in Western cultures of saying hello. And so, you know, shaking hands is an exchange of germs, whether that's a expression of confidence and welcome, or whether that's a something you want to avoid is up for debate at this point. Fist bumps. Fist bumps are good, but they can too transmit germs. And so it's something to think about, you know, uh, just what's going on to your hands. Alcohol, iodine, et cetera, absolutely. Um, uh, alcohol especially is what we usually use on hands. Iodine certainly can help and is used for a lot of procedures and, uh, and going along that bypassing and breaking down defenses, inserting needles. So great example, Chelsea. Other things that we do. So this is great. So honestly, one of the things you find about infection prevention and as you work through this model is that there are a lot of things that are, um, that are spreading germs, but what you do about them break, breaks down into some basic key components. So hand hygiene, we say clean your hand, cleaning your hands in, in Project First Line sort of plain language. That's the biggest one. In fact, sometimes it's better than gloves, hand hygiene is, particularly if you are a healthy person with healthy impact skin keeping your, your skin clean may actually spread fewer germs than putting gloves on. But gloves are very important for keeping things off of your skin. And so are a key way that we prevent things from getting onto the skin. Alcohol, iodine, and all the other ways that we disinfect the skin prior to procedures, that is huge for preventing that spread through bypassing or breaking down defenses. And so that's a great, a great topic. And then just what we touch, which you guys also mentioned and how much you touch. Fist bump is great because it's less surface area than the palm of your hand, right? But it's, it also is, are you gonna touch the doorknob? Uh, are you gonna touch your face, which you will see I do constantly and I'm trying to work on. Are you going to touch your mask, your PPE? Are you going to prepare medications? All of these things, in the world of, of, uh, of watching what you touch, which gets to one thing that I would add to this category, which is cleaning and disinfection of the environment. So preventing things from getting on the skin, a lot of it is about what the skin will touch and making sure that those places are cleaned and disinfected. So that even if I pick it up on my skin um, or if I touch a surface like the bed rail, that I'm not gonna get germs because that bed rail has been recently cleaned or recently disinfected. Obviously, we're not going to rid the world of, um, of germs, particularly on the skin. And obviously these germs can also be very healthy for normal healthy people, right? You, you lose your skin microbiome, you're gonna have a problem. So you want to, uh, you want to balance those things out, but when you're thinking about healthcare and your tests, you can think about, okay, what's my skin interacting with? Do I need to clean my hands here? Do I need to clean this surface? Do I need to, you know, 
make sure the doorknob is disinfected because people have been going in and out all day? Does it need an extra clean? So thinking through those things, oops, sorry guys, thinking through those things are all part of this recognition of skin. Moving on to the GI system. So I told you I was going to give you my fun best fact. Uh, the CDC actually has a poster with this fact on it. It's one of my favorite posters. If you think about a paper clip, right, the size of a paper clip, that's approximately one gram in its weight. And if you took one gram of stool, size of a paper clip, and you counted how many germs, how many pathogens, whether yeast or bacteria were in that stool, the number you would find would be around 1 trillion, right? So stool, we, we sometimes refer to this as the fecal patina. Some of you have probably heard about that, but stool is everywhere because there's just so many germs in it that it's very hard for people to keep their hands clean and we go to the bathroom all the time. <laughs> the gut, so our GI system is extremely important. That's all to say the GI system is very important in how we think about uh, healthcare and healthcare associated infections. The gut in our model refers most of the time to the most of the intestines. So there's variation across um, sources as to how much of the intestines are, are part of the sort of gut, but most of the time, it's most of the intestine system, the rectum and the anus. Gut germs travel easily in stool. They belong there. They keep us healthy. Uh, many of us at this point are familiar with the gut microbiome. Uh, and so you know that if you see anything related to the GI system, you will find bacteria. You will find yeast. You will find pathogens. The pathways for GI system uh, for germs, for GI system germs, is basically the same as that of skin, touch, and breaking down or bypassing the body's defenses. So when you think about the GI system and you think about the ways that you prevent bugs from spreading into or out of the GI system, mostly out of in this particular case, what sort of what sort of things do you think about? What ways, what methods do you use to prevent, prevent GI system bugs from causing problems? This is a little trickier than the last one. Any thoughts? If they spread by touch, washing fruits and veggies. Okay, great, absolutely. So. The fecal oral transmission route is a real thing. <laughs> um, and, and so washing fruits and vegetables is one way keeping in general nutrition hygiene uh, to make up a term uh, is, is a big deal when you're talking about dietary, when you're talking about nutrition uh, in healthcare and institutional settings. So absolutely washing hands thoroughly that's key. So again, the pathway is touch. And so even though we're talking about the gastrointestinal system, we're talking a lot about that same thing for GI that we talked about for skin, keeping our hands clean. Probiotics, I see you guys mentioned this. So probiotics are interesting. The data on probiotics tends to be equivocal. It's unclear how much probiotics benefit and how much um, how much it might prevent spread. Uh, and I think particularly we think about things like C. diff and making sure that the gut remains colonized with C. diff. Jury's still out is the, is the N word on probiotics right now. Unclear what the advantages are. What I will say is that for most of populations, it's probably not an issue. In healthcare, you wanna be very careful though, because probiotics with patients who have severely immunosuppressed systems can cause problems. So some people can get sick from the bacteria and probiotics because their immune systems are so weak. So not to say that you shouldn't, should or shouldn't use it, just be careful and make sure that you're, you're talking to that patient's you know, providers to, to make sure that it's okay for them to use because there are some people who can get sick from the bacteria and probiotics.
Balanced diets, keeping your healthy microbiome healthy. That is something that is important for sure. Jury is still out on that one as well, just like with probiotics as to how much that's gonna prevent spread. Access to clean water, absolutely. So, you know, keeping, keeping pathogens like Giardia, some of these other um, parasites that can be in water or even bacteria that can be in water. Uh, water is not sterile. There's bacteria in water and we'll talk about that. But it is, as, but it is um, when it is regulated by the city or a state EPA, then it, there's, there are markers as to how many pathogens can be there. Well, water is a little bit different and uh, there are sort of jurisdictional issues around that. There are some people who can't drink well water or are not supposed to drink well water. And that is, this is a very important point. So again, this weakened immune system question becomes key. Restrooms, yes, unhoused people don't always have access to restrooms and restrooms with toilet paper and restrooms with sinks and hand sanitizer. All of that um, you know, can, can be an issue for spread. How, in the healthcare system, that is much less of an issue for, for sure, but I can definitely see how in the community that would be a big deal. Other things that I honestly think of, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. I still go back to cleaning and disinfection. And, um, and also containing stool and diarrhea, right? So if a patient is incontinent, having a way to manage that, having a way to uh, get rid of the stool so it doesn't spread elsewhere, that's a, a big deal. All right, respiratory system. You have got your upper airway, which is your nose, mouth, throat, and your trachea, your windpipe um, in plain language. And then you have your lungs which basically is how we're gonna summarize the lower airway, much to the um, chagrin of the pulmonologists out there. But these actually do have a microbiome. It's small, it's very much still in the process of being understood. We used to think in particular that the lungs had no bacteria in them, that is not the case. Uh, and, but it is, it's an evolving science as with many things. The nose, the mouth, and the throat very much are colonized. And so they have their own pathogens uh, that are unique and that you always have to think about that as a, um, as a space, a reservoir with, with microbes inside. Pathways, here we get into some new ones. So breathing in is a big pathway, oops, big pathway in reservoirs, in respiratory system reservoirs. And that is a, a way that many respiratory system germs, not all, but many will travel between people. Splashes and sprays. So this really is about saliva, spit, and then for intubated patients, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the suctioning and other manipulation of airways. And that's, that too is kind of new. You don't really get splashes and sprays off the of skin. You could in GI, we didn't wanna go there, but you could. And so there's a lot of studies in GI right now about what the role of the toilet is, what the role of the stool um, being aerosolized is, et cetera. So that's a kind of an asterisk there, but here it's a, it's a major pathway. Most traditionally droplet diseases are considered diseases of actual direct contact with, with um, respiratory droplets, the lar larger respiratory droplets. That paradigm is slowly evolving. I think you're gonna see changes, especially as COVID has, has emerged um, that you know, immediately became an issue and has continued to be an issue. So, uh, so this can evolve, will evolve, but right now I, I would think about both the breathing in and the splashes and sprays as kind of these two things on a spectrum that uh, transmit disease. And then touch. Again, we touch our faces a lot. And so you want to think about bacteria in particular and yeast in particular uh, of spreading from touching mucous membranes like the nose, like the mouth, like the eyes. So if you think about how we prevent things from spreading into or out of the respiratory system, what kinds of things do you think about here?
What have you guys been doing in the pandemic to prevent spread? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Danita. I'll say it again. When you think about the respiratory system, things moving in and out of the respiratory system, how do you stop? How do you stop pathogens? How do you stop germs from moving in and out of the respiratory system? Awesome. Masking, masking, masking. Great, great. You guys are on it. PPE in general, absolutely. There are certain things, especially when you go at the touch. This is why gowns and gloves are still recommended because there are things that can come right out of the mouth and eyes and nose and, and spread. Um, social distancing, great. So that's another great example of where your control isn't actually about things that are on the individual or happening with the individual, but actually behavioral things that you do to prevent spread. Ventilation, Carmen, you're, you're preaching, preaching in my language. So ventilation, something again, that is a system, a systems-based approach here, where you're saying, let's get the pathogen out of the air. Let's prevent it from being breathed in. Shields, shields, yes, face shields and eye protection. This is actually where eye protection comes in. It's those little droplets hitting the mucous membrane uh, that are the issue. There's a lot of controversy because it's very hard to determine whether or not infection is happening through that route. But uh, the eye does have some receptors for COVID-19. It certainly has receptors for things like adenovirus. Um, and there are pathogens that can get in through the eye, which is actually connected to the back of your throat through your tear ducts. So things that can get into your eye eventually can get into your throat. Uh, these are great. Yeah, the plexiglass protectors, let's talk about those briefly. Plexiglass protectors, it really depends, nobody knows, and it kind of depends on how it's set up. So it's very hard to study because each individual situation is different. And there isn't great guidance about how to make your situation the best possible. So here's what I'll tell you about plexiglass. They are probably good for catching some of those big droplet splashes and sprays that we talked about. When it comes to things that float in the air a little bit longer, that's where it starts to get tough. Air currents um, are what determine how those smaller droplets travel. And those air currents in a room are not simple. They often have places in your room that are very active where air is flowing quickly and freely. And then there are places in a room that are dead space where air kind of bundles up in a current and doesn't really escape that current very well. Kind of like any large body of water. There are currents that are strong, there are currents that are weak. There are places in the, in the water where if you were to dump a lot of food coloring, it would travel very quickly into that place. There are places in the water where if you dumped a lot of food coloring there, it would sit and slowly disperse. Same thing with those plastic barriers. You put one up, you have places where, you know, if I'm speaking directly at the barrier, there's a lot hitting it and that's fine. But then there's other places with that barrier where dead space is created. So air actually tends to roll up into corners, for example, and it can be very hard to ventilate that corner. So you wanna be careful that those dead spaces that are created with a barrier, um, that they, that one, they, they can get ventilated and two, that the person who is interacting at the barrier um, isn't exposed to the dead space. Fans, so probably not. In essence, you are creating a new current, but you don't necessarily know where it goes. Um, the, the way I would recommend it is this. So I would not think of a barrier as the only thing you use, right? Uh, so if, if you are in an environment where you say, I want to protect the person behind the registration desk, what can I do? Barriers are one thing, but they should not be the only thing. So you want to make sure that person has good ventilation. And then you want to make sure that when they're interacting with patients, they're wearing a mask. In fact, right now in healthcare, if you are in an institution where you consider yourself under healthcare guidance, you should be wearing a mask all the time with very few exceptions. And so really the combination of those things takes down risk. And that's this idea of 
there's not one thing in healthcare that we do that takes the risk from 100% to zero. It's a layer upon layer upon layer of things that diminishes the risk as much as possible to protect people. So, um, so when you are doing these things, it's not that barriers are wrong. Certainly they have a, a place, but just don't think of them as the one thing that you're going to do. Um, the mask, which mask state, the one about masks and, and how in healthcare you should be using them. <laughs> so if you are in healthcare, if you are following the healthcare infection control guidance, you should be wearing a mask at work all the time. There are very few exceptions to that. They have to do with being in a low or moderate prevalence institution or a county, sorry, if you're, and not, this is not the community levels, this is the healthcare associated levels, which are different just to make it confusing. Um, but you should be in a lower model, moderate, which is yellow and blue on the healthcare levels map. Um, that, yep, ambulatory care location, this would apply. Masks, you can unmask in some situations when you're in a meeting and everyone is vaccinated um, or, in some break rooms where everyone is vaccinated, you can remove your mask. Otherwise in healthcare, the recommendation right now is that everyone is in a medical surgical mask uh, or all the time or better. You could be in an N95 if you prefer, um, but in general, at least having a, a medical or surgical mask on. Um, Can you clarify, Nancy, what you mean by up to date or fully up to oh and up to date or fully vaccinated? I got you, I got you. So uh, up to date, up to date on vaccination, not just fully vaccinated. Okay, lots of stuff in the in the respiratory system. I'm going to move uh, on just for the sake of time, but continue to ask these questions and hold them, and we can we've got we've got time. We can keep going here. Um. So blood, blood is our last reservoir. This is a unique reservoir in that it is not supposed to have germs, though blood has germs in it on a routine basis, just it's not supposed to. So what do I mean by that? There is this thing called transient bacteremia. All of us at certain points in the day will have bacteria in our blood. Usually it's associated with doing things like brushing your teeth or wiping your bum. Um, and those are, they essentially create micro cracks in mucous membranes or in uh, skin, your anal skin, that allow germs to slip in and slip through. Your body deals with that every single day. But if you were to test a person's blood and if you found bacteria in it, you'd be concerned. Uh, it, you wouldn't let that one pass. That's, a, that's an important point. So in general, you're supposed to, to assume one, you're to, you're to assume that blood has germs in it for the sake of infection control, but for the sake of clinical care, those germs are not supposed to be there in general. Um, some viruses cause infections that release virus into the blood. And here's why in infection control, we assume that this is happening. So if a person is infected or untreated, blood can then spread that virus to other people. And it's really viruses. Bacteria really do not do this uh, as much. And when they do, it's because somebody has a really bad infection in some, in some place that is hiding out. So for the most part, this is about viruses. This is hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. You should always assume that blood you see has those viruses in it, whether or not it actually does. You might even know that it doesn't because that person may have been tested. You should still assume that they're there. And that, that is the thinking that guides your infection control actions. The biggest way things get into and out of blood is through baking, breaking down or bypassing the body's defenses. And here we're really talking about needles and other devices inserted into the bloodstream or even things like surgery or procedures done on the body where bleeding happens and sharp objects abound. Uh, so this is, that's, that's the blood reservoir. However, 
Um, you also want to think about blood as a great place for bacteria to grow. So once it gets out of the body and gets smeared on, you know, the bedside table or the phlebotomy chair, it is food for the bacteria in that, in that reservoir and those bacteria will eat it up and grow substantially. In fact, this is how we grow bacteria in the lab. We get a Petri dish, it has sheep's blood in it. We put our sample on the Petri dish. We stick it in the, in the incubator for a couple of hours, day and a half, day, day and a half, and it will grow stuff. Uh, so assume that if you see blood, you are seeing a bacterial garden that uh, needs to be dealt with. Splashes and sprays, obviously blood is the liquid, so it will splash and spray places. Uh, and so you wanna be considering that pathway as you do things that stick needles in people, stick, op stick devices in people, um, or otherwise open up the, the circulatory system. And, and then touch, we sort of said that really most viruses in blood do not spread by touch. There are a few exceptions. Hepatitis B is the one you want to worry about the most because it can be very sneaky in how it gets into people and it survives for a very long time. Uh, but in general, touch is really talking about bacteria. Okay, so when you think about protection, protection against blood, how you protect um, yourself, how you protect patients from getting infections in blood or having infections in blood get to others, what sort of things protect people from blood? Gloves, absolutely. So assuming that there's things in there, you put the gloves on so that the blood goes on the gloves, that there's trace or minimal amounts on the hands, you remove that blood very quickly. Absolutely. PPE in general, you guys are mentioning. Sharps management, big one, big one. Needle boxes, great. Absolutely getting those needles into places where they can't stick people in the hands. Intact skin, wonderful. So that's huge, um, is making sure that the skin of whomever is interacting with the blood is intact so that it doesn't um, uh, travel through micro cracks. Uh, Wonderful. I would also add things like safety devices on your needles. So, and making sure that everybody knows how to use the needle retractors. You can also think of things like um, good vision, right? Making sure you can see where the needle is going. Uh, there are some surgeries where that can be an issue where you're working in small spaces. If you don't, if you aren't able to see where that sharp end is, that's a threat. So a lot of this goes in injection safety, cleaning and disinfection of the skin prior to inserting a needle is another one that prevents um, germs from getting into the, into the uh, bloodstream. Wound care for yourself, absolutely. And actually, Danita, I would even say wound care for, for the patient too. I think both of those very much apply. For that the bus is um, for this next we got page. somebody off mute. Just there you go. Okay. So we're going to go on clean needles. Absolutely, Nancy. This is great. We are going to go on to um, healthcare environment reservoirs. So reservoirs in the environment. We've got four that we have chosen, two of which we have just talked about, and two which um, are a little bit more abstract, but worth thinking about. So water and wet surfaces, as I mentioned, water is not sterile, it's clean, very clean, but not sterile. Dry surfaces, which are the most common reservoir that we interact with in healthcare, dirt, and then devices. And you can see some examples under each of these in terms of the kinds of things um, that you're looking at. So water and wet surfaces. We use water in so many ways in healthcare and many ways that we don't even think about. Obviously there's eating and drinking, but, um, but we do things like wound care. We do things like procedures. We, um, we, uh, we use water to uh, clean trauma, we, trauma wounds. So it's, uh, it's definitely diverse. And there are lots of places in healthcare where water is available. 
um, whether that's in sinks, toilets, whether that's part of your soil utility, whether that is dialysis, where we're talking about extremely clean water, um, and that's a diff, totally different kind of, of water. But all of these are good places for germs to grow. And anytime water gets on a surface or a liquid, which is usually mostly water, um, gets on a surface, that becomes a good place for germs to grow. Pathways in water and wet surfaces touch, again, splashes and sprays, that will be no surprise. But breathing in is one that many people don't think about. So uh, the most common water pathogen you tend to hear about in healthcare is Legionella. It's actually relatively uncommon in terms of causing disease. There are other water bugs, the water germs that cause disease more often. But the thing about Legionella that is true for other water pathogens as well, is that most of the time people get Legionella not by drinking the water or having it you know, on their skin, but by the water becoming a fine mist, aerosolization, much like respiratory droplets um, and contain aerosols. So just like we breathe out aerosols, so too when we run water, run showers, flush toilets and have uh, heater cooler units at our institutions, those create water droplets that are small enough to travel around in the air. And so those can be breathed in and pathogens can take hold that way. All right, when we think about what we do to protect ourselves from water, what kinds of things, this is a little bit, it, it, this is a trickier one. The body ones tend to be easier than the environment sometimes. But what kind of things you do, do you do to protect uh, people from, from germs in water and wet surfaces? What kind of actions do you take? Hand dryers in the bathroom are germ spreaders. Yeah, so actually, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there was a research project that was done at one point that looked at that. What happens is, is so much air goes through those dryers and it concentrates the bacteria that are in air. Um, so some of that is water and air, some of that is bacteria and air, and they can, in fact, blow germs straight onto your hands. It's not like that air is filtered by uh, these, these hand blowers. So sometimes, yes, they can spread germs. Uh, and in general, we don't always recommend hand dryers in healthcare settings. Cleaning water systems routinely. So routine maintenance of your water system, knowing when it should be checked and for what you will find germs in your water and that can be okay. Not every germ in water is bad, um, but, but uh, you do wanna make sure you are doing the right amount of maintenance and flushing and things like that. Chelsea, cleaning and drying surfaces, absolutely. So you want to have those surfaces dry. Martin, you've mentioned that too. Anything that grows mold, drywall, et cetera, absolutely, that's a big one, especially for those of us who live in buildings that flood on a regular basis. Um, and so that's, um, that's important. Uh, using sterile water for wound care, absolutely. So when you're thinking about wounds, you, those wounds are very dirty, especially if they're exposed to the air, don't misunderstand, but you wanna be careful uh, particularly if you're working with patients who have any immune suppression, their ability to heal that wound and when it's exposed to water that has germs in it can be problematic. Now, if it's somebody you, who you're recommending can still shower and take baths, that's one thing. And so then, you know, you're also saying, okay, this can be exposed to normal water. But if you're concerned at all about their healing and whatnot, you want to be conscious of, of that, the water that you use, particularly when you're in the healthcare environment, particularly if you're breaking open skin, um, if you're creating a wound in that bypassing and breakdown. Misters are common in the desert. Yes, they are because it is so dry. How dangerous are they? Unfortunately, it's, it, they can be dangerous. So you want to be very careful about your misters and in terms of how much they're cleaned and disinfected. In general, in healthcare, I'd recommend against it, but I would work 
with your facilities HVAC team because they can adjust the humidity in your building. And so if you're, if you're feeling like you're in a healthcare environment where it's too dry, that is also bad. It breaks down skin, which is your own protective barrier. And you do want to talk to, to facilities about getting the humidity in a range that is recommended for healthcare. The Healthcare Environmental Infection Control Guidelines, which are a CDC guideline, um, do give you some guidance on what healthy um, humidity should be in healthcare. That being said, um, it's not always possible to get it to that level. And so you, you want to see how close you can get. I also will say there's new guidance on that. Um, that is from ASHE and ASHRAE. I think it's A-S-H-R-A-E or R-E, one of the two. Um, and they, it's called Standard 170. It is the recommendations for air quality and air control in healthcare settings. And that would tell you for your setting, um, which it sounds like ambulatory outpatient, if I remember correctly, um, that what is the recommended humidity for your settings. Um, <laughs> So, so be careful with those humidifiers. Um, yeah, uh, boiling the water before drinking. I too used to live in a house that was, was well water and, and we had to be very careful and there were a lot of, a lot of different things you have to do. Um, and you knowing what the quality of your water is and what you have to do to it in order to use it safely is important. Changing water filters, absolutely. I lumped that under um, maintenance, but it's, it's part of the, Part of the standards. EPA approved cleaners, Natalie, I'm glad you mentioned that. So when you are doing cleaning, um, making sure that your, your uh, disinfectants are approved for the pathogens that you're aiming to kill. Which brings us straight over into dry surfaces and red safaris. Uh, the germs found in the body and the air and the stool can also be found in dry surfaces. So the surfaces of your environment collect microbes. Frankly, it's reassuring to me that many of these microbes will die after a period of time. But there are a number that live and live long durations. Um, C. diff spores can be found months after a patient has left a C. diff room. Um, and there's some indication they can actually survive for years. So don't think that time will solve all ills in this case. It really does involve other activities. Uh, but dry surfaces have germs on them and high touch surfaces are the key thing you want to think about. So where are people putting their hands um, to do things? Bed rails, doorknobs, you guys have mentioned them all, telephones, keyboards, mouses, light switches. Uh, those, are, those are your high risk ones. And then kind of all your other surfaces still need a plan for cleaning and disinfection, but, um, but it doesn't have to be quite as frequent as you do these high touch surfaces. Obviously, um, with that said, the pathway often on dry surfaces is touch. And then two, you can break down and bypass the body's defensive with the defenses with dry surfaces. Um, that is actually much rarer and kind of these are, we put that in mostly thinking through how these get through touch onto the skin and then by sticking a needle in or doing other things with the skin, you are, you are then creating this pathway from dry surfaces to skin into the blood, into the body. So uh, going back to taking action on this, I'm not going to have you guys go through it because you did most of it for dry surfaces or for wet surfaces. Cleaning and disinfection, cleaning and disinfection, cleaning and disinfection, and then just making sure that things don't get onto that surface to begin with. Um, those are really the two major things that you do. Uh, and so, um, so this is really where your environmental services folks, um, both in wet surfaces and dry surfaces, have this huge impact on infection control. And they are part of the multidisciplinary infection control team in that way. They are, are key to making sure that germs stay off of these surfaces as much as possible. Dirt and dust. I wanna spend some time here. Uh, and again, uh, 
this is this is a, a unique one. So when we are talking about dirt, soil, and dust, we are really talking about things that happen with construction and maintenance projects. This is not necessarily the household dust uh, that you have in every day that you are, you know, finding in the corner where where the visible dust piles up. This is more the dust, the sand, the dirt. Speaking of dry desert areas, that that. Um, comes from soil or from construction materials. And these have germs on them. Usually we're talking about fungal spores. So this is a big one, uh, particularly in desert areas because of coccidioides, but it can happen as well in places like the Mississippi River Valley where we talk about histoplasma and blastomyces. Um, and it can happen all over for germs like cryptococcus. This is why um, we do what we do for construction, and I will talk about that in the next slide. The pathways here that you're thinking about, breathing things in, almost all of the pathogens that we worry about in dust and dirt are pathogens that are breathed in. For most of us, healthy as we are, it's not an issue. But again, in healthcare, things are different. People on steroids, people on chemotherapy, people with HIV, um, and AIDS, particularly with the CD4 count under 200. These people are at high risk. Anyone with lung disease is at a higher risk. Um, this, is not a, this is not a benign thing, unfortunately. And we tend to think of this as, oh, well, we're breathing it in every day. It's not a problem. But um, people whose immune systems are not robust, it can be a really big problem. And these infections are very difficult to treat. So you will see fungal infections in healthcare make the news at times. They usually are in some way related to dirt and dust, not always, but usually. And you will find that it is very hard for systems to get rid of these outbreaks because it's just so pervasive. So avoiding it in the first place is the goal. What do you do? Well, construction and maintenance should always have an assessment of the risk that it is going to uh, take. These are called ICRAs, ICRAs, Infection Control Risk Assessments. People who do construction and maintenance in healthcare should be familiar with how to do them and, and the components that are involved. And there are a number of training programs out there that teach people how to do ICRAs, but you should have an ICRA for every project. If you are not sure, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ICRAs are, <laughs> they're not exactly everybody's favorite thing to do, but if you think about it as a part of patient care, it can kind of, it helps. It makes it less painful. You're really, this is a, a care action that you're taking for everybody in the environment. If you are not sure and you see a construction project going on, you should ask them if they have an ICRA because um, they should, or they should have, and they, usually it should be posted, especially for big projects. Barriers, the most common one you'll see is plastic sheeting or hard barriers that create um, a, a barrier between the construction space and the clinical space. Those may or may not be supplemented with air, like HEPA filters that are blowing the construction air out of the building. That is all, you know, all encompassed in that. The ICRA should say and should deter, help people determine what kind of barriers are needed. So ventilation is huge in this, barriers are huge in this. So, um, and, uh, and also just a sheer recognition of what the risks are. Not every construction project needs barriers. Some of them create minimal or no dust. And therefore, you know, the ICRA suggests that you just need to take minimal precautions. Uh, agricultural areas where soil is constantly being worked. Nancy, great, great example. So this is um, why many uh, fungal infections are more common in certain areas of the country or in certain professions. What I would say is, in general, the filters that you have on buildings are very good at filtering out many of these pathogens, but not all. And we know that when construction or agriculture or other soil working is happening near a healthcare center, that there is a, there's a real risk for uh, infections from those pathogens increasing. What you can do, one, avoiding open doors and windows. I know that can be very hard depending on your setting, 
but making sure that the air you are breathing in the building is going through the filter. Two, I would say making sure that your ventilation, again, this is about talking to your HVAC team, your ventilation is, uh, is optimized. And what do I mean by that? Making sure that all the air changes are what they should be, making sure the outside air is what it should be. So there is some outside air mixing that you need to do, you have to do in order to keep the air pleasant, frankly. Um, so just making sure that that's happening, making sure that the filter you're using is the best that you can use for the system that you've got. Not every system can handle a HEPA filter, nor should it. It takes a lot of energy. So um, just being careful about that as well. Uh, and then, you know, making sure you know who your very high risk patients are. So here we're really talking about people on strong chemotherapy regimens and uh, um, bone marrow transplant. How are we doing for time, Carmen? Are we doing okay? Yeah, we're doing great here. Um, we have about 20 minutes left um, for q and I know we've been answering questions along the way, but if you wanted some extra time to, in case other questions come up, we have about 20 minutes. All right, sounds good. I will try to keep myself on track. Um, and then devices. So devices are often in contact with multiple surfaces and people. And they are used on a patient's body and they're used in a patient's body. So anything that you use on the body is considered a device. Um, this includes your blood pressure cuff and your stethoscope, but this also includes your high level devices like endoscopes and artificial joints. Devices are a reservoir in many ways, but in general, they involve either breaking down the body's defenses or touch. So again, the things used on the body versus the things used in the body, um, that's kind of how we break down devices. They aren't 100% environmental and they aren't 100% a, a body reservoir. It really depends on the device and what you're using it for and how you're using it. So this is kind of a catch-all category, but it's so important that we wanted to make it its own category and we just put it under the environment. The, when you think about how to protect people from devices, there's, you come back actually to dry surfaces for a lot of these. For the things that are used on the body, usually you're talking about stuff that has its own dry surfaces. It just so happens that we, we slap the surface right on the body um, and interact directly with the skin. And so there you want to do cleaning and disinfection. That's the big number one thing you wanna do. Make sure that you have all your devices cleaned and disinfected as they are recommended by the manufacturer. When it comes to devices that go into the body, most of them that are going into clean spaces like the blood, like the, um, the most of the tissue, uh, they should be sterile and truly sterile, not just disinfected, but completely eliminated of, of germs. And so a lot of it is about making sure that you have a way to recognize that the things that, that, that are going on with those instruments, um, that they're do, being done in a sterile way and that the instruments themselves, the devices themselves are sterile and you have evidence of that. Things that go into dirty cavities on the other hand, so your, <laughs> your endoscopes, your colonoscopes, um, your bronchoscopes, these also need to have uh, disinfection beyond just um, the surface disinfection we might do uh, for, for things that touch the skin. These things need to have a higher level disinfection. And it really depends on what device you're using and what you're doing with it as to what kind of disinfection it needs. The, the biggest um, take home for this is know what kind of cleaning and disinfection or sterilization your device needs. And that should be true of every device you use in healthcare from a stethoscope all the way on up to your artificial hip. There are instructions about how you know things are sterile, your instructions for cleaning and disinfecting. All of these devices have them. Um, they are usually written by the manufacturer and approved through the FDA as part of the approval process. So, so, 
more than anything else, get the instructions for use from the manufacturer for each of your devices, know how to recognize when they're sterile, know how to keep them sterile or disinfected and, um, and have that process in place for yourself. And if you're not sure if a device has been properly cleaned or sterilized, either clean and disinfect it or don't use it. That's really, it, that's key. All right, to bring all of this together, we spent a lot of time talking about reservoirs and I really, I wanted to um, allow you all the opportunity to think through this reservoir pathway action steps, especially regarding the body. And the reason why has to do with risk and how we're gonna use these reservoirs. So risk recognition in our model is seeing the potential for a problem to happen. This doesn't mean that that problem is going to happen. By all means, this, this is a problem that, you know, that may never occur if, if we're lucky, but you recognize um, an event and you say, ah, this situation could lead to something bad. My favorite one from personal life is seeing children play on the side of a road and you're driving down it, right? You don't just ignore that happening. You know, children plus road equals higher risk. So you might slow down. You might keep your eye on the kids as you're driving past. You're a little bit more attentive. You're ready for anything to happen because you never know if a child's gonna run out on the street. So that's recognizing a risk. Hopefully it will never happen. That child will never leave the sidewalk. They'll continue to play. They've got their eyes on you because they know you're a risk too. Um, but you see the potential for that problem and you take an action. In healthcare, a non-infection control one is a, a, an elder who is unstable, right? So you might see an elderly patient trying to get up from a chair and you see that they're struggling or you see that they're wobbling and you go over to help because you're in your brain, you see wobbling and you say, ah, risk for a fall. And you, it happens in a second. That's a habit that you've developed that you know, you, you know as part of your experience. A lot of infection control risks can work the same way. You see the potential for a problem, the potential for a germ to spread, the potential for um, a pathogen to leave its reservoir or to get on to a new reservoir, and you say, stop. And that's really where in, um, Project First Line wants to go with this idea. So reservoirs are a way of organizing your mind to think through risks. So I look at this picture, for example, and I, I would say, I would ask you, what reservoirs might cause risk here? So if you can name a reservoir and then a potential risk, and you want, if you want to put those in the chat, can you see something here where you would say, this is the reservoir and the risk could be X. As you're thinking, I will give you one example. So you can see a counter in the background. Um, so I look at that counter in the background and I say, okay, that's a dry surface. And so there are certain organisms on the dry surface that could be a risk to get off that surface through touch. And so I know that that dry surface needs to be cleaned and disinfected on a regular basis. Awesome, Michelle, clipboard, pen, couch, counter, awesome. All dry surfaces, right? So you have this series of dry surfaces. Permeable clipboards are harder to clean. Yes, they are. They are easier to harbor germs. Germs do tend to die faster on permeable surfaces, but you're, you're right, permeable surfaces are hard to clean. And that's why we don't use them as much um, as impermeable surfaces. So plastic, plastic clipboard, maybe a good idea. Um, so all dry surfaces, other reservoirs that you guys see here that you say, mm, this reservoir could be a risk.
Clothing, okay, absolutely. So clothing, another dry surface, another place where, where germs can live and transfer, particularly as she's sitting down. Hands and exposed skin, absolutely. So this one also, the skin reservoir, she's got her hands, their pens, it's, uh, she's you know, writing. Um, and so, so that's another major one low quality mask. <laughs> so I agree, even if it's, a, if it's a reasonable quality, she's got a lot of gaps around her mask, right? So that's a respiratory reservoir um, is where you start thinking. The risk is from not the mask itself, but from what she's breathing in and out. And the mask is supposed to try to protect her from that or protect you from that. Um, and it may not be doing its full job. So maybe suboptimal protection because there's a problem with the respiratory system that isn't well, um, well um, mitigated, that isn't well cared for. And then the eyes, yeah, her eyes could be a reservoir. She could have something going on or she could rub, you know, she could take her skin reservoir and rub the, her eyes and things could come out of the eyes which we didn't talk about as a reservoir. That's another one that's kind of a special, a spe sub-specialized reservoir. We usually talk about it in terms of the respiratory system, even though technically it's not, it's just connected in. Um, but definitely touch pathway to and from the eyes is a, is a big one. So this is all great. So you see how by saying, for me, what I, I often do these days is I, I go through by reservoir, okay, what are my dry surfaces? Are, and how do, I, how do I think about the risks? What are the risks to those dry surfaces? What are my wet surfaces? In this picture, we don't really have any. What are my, um, what are my uh, skin issues? So she's touching a few things that I need to think about, a few of those dry surfaces. And are her hands clean because she's coughing into them? Respiratory system. So I, I think through these, these things. Do I see any devices? No. Do I see any construction or maintenance? No. So I don't have to worry about those reservoirs. But by first identifying the reservoirs, then I can think about spread. Then I can think about actions. And that pathway, reservoir spread actions, reservoirs pathway actions, reservoirs pathway actions, allows you to think about any situation that you encounter and ask yourself if there's something you need to do to decrease the risk. And that really is what Project First Lines materials now and in the future are going to be about, um, about taking this idea of using reservoirs to recognize your risks and then doing something about those risks to try to lower them. So bringing it all together, We've got our eight reservoirs, four in the body, the skin, the GI, the respiratory system and the blood, and four in the environment, water, wet surfaces, dirt and dust, dry surfaces, and um, I'm sorry, water, wet surfaces, dry surfaces, dirt and dust, and devices. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so just to close this out, I want you to think briefly about your care space and your spaces where you work. And I want you to think about reservoir, a reservoir that concerns you in your space. Um, what can you do to recognize the risks around that reservoir going on in the future after this presentation? And what one action would you think about taking with that reservoir to help decrease the risk? So you don't have to read it in the chat. This is really for you to think through to applying it to your own um, your own situation, but this is how we would think through um, infection control risks uh, under the project first line model. Key takeaways. The places where germs live are called reservoirs. There are reservoirs in the body and in the environment. Our infection control actions are connected to how germs spread to and from these reservoirs and to different areas of the body, to one person, to another, from people to things or thing to people. So um, you, these pathways dictate our actions, how we stop this spread and recognizing those pathways, recognizing those actions really starts with recognizing those reservoirs. By doing this, by taking this time, one, Eventually we build the habit and becomes easier to do. 
but also we're achieving the thing that we most want to do when we do infection control, which is to prevent people from getting sick. With that, I'll open it up for final questions. Thank you for bearing with a long presentation, everybody. Does anybody have any pending questions either on this material or on sort of other infection control topics that they wanted to touch on? Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carlson. This was uh, very, very uh, interesting. Certainly for me living, uh, I'm the person that lives in the desert um, and has this agricultural community so yeah. not only do we have dry soil, but now we have broken soil or soil where the fungi is being turned over pretty constantly. Yeah. And it, I live and where I work is on a reservation. And many of these homes are located directly in the middle of fields or on the edges of fields. And they're, uh, they're, con they're completely encompassed with dust during the time that the fields are being worked. Sure. And um, so you've given me some definite food for thought on, on how I might begin to try and understand the impact um, on these families and, you know, where, where is the asthma popping up, where are the respiratory issues popping up, and just how close are they? Any suggestions where I might look for some solutions on measuring air quality? Air quality is very, very tough. And I think, you know, where I actually would start would be with the EPA and looking at their resources on air quality. Because you're talking, are you talking about in the healthcare setting or at home in these communities? Um, well, we have an ambulatory care uh, facility mm -hmm. um, that that is is on the reservation as well as, okay. you know, as well as schools and long-term care facilities. So we have a lot of healthcare related. We have no hospital mm -hmm. setting, but we That's do have right. ambulance. Yeah. yeah, but 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 all of them are impacted by these conditions. Um, no, no one's safe. Um, and, then, and then of course, we also have the combined issues of traffic, um, a highway system that goes across the reservation. We have a, a large airport that has uh, redirected its flight patterns over the reservation. Right. So Over there's, here. yeah, and then there's dust and then there's the, you know, the agricultural pieces where this is yeah. being churned up and the winds, I mean, uh, just, sure. just the mere natural. So um, just, just kind of trying to understand um, when they talk about the quality of the air, yeah. um, what, where we might start or how we might be effective in reducing um, or increasing infection control in these, in these, yeah. in these buildings. So, so I would divide this, and this is kind of in my bias because this is the, this is the field that I'm in, but I would divide it into healthcare and non-healthcare settings. Um, so in non-healthcare settings, the, I actually, there's some reassurance for me to give because we, even though we talk about infection control and all of these things, and they're all incredibly important, the human body is incredibly good at dealing with infection. So from the infection standpoint, you're, all of us, me included, all of us are breathing in fungus all the time. Um, most of it is not gonna harm us. Most of it is, uh, is either gonna die in the lungs or our immune system is gonna take care of it and we'll be fine. Um, some of us might get an infection and never even know it. Most of us, who uh, live in the Mississippi River Valley or have lived in that valley during our lives have had histoplasmosis at some time. Most of us never know. So there's, there's a lot that a normal healthy person can tolerate in terms of the actual infection risk. For healthcare, it's just, it's a different and it depends on the populations you're serving, what their, um, their issues are, their background medical issues are, and, uh, and how, you know, how much you have available to you at your particular healthcare institution. Um, what I would advocate for, for healthcare is to look at the guidance on healthcare um, environment and air quality from the CDC and then ASHE, A-S-H-E and ASHRAE who put out 
what's standard 170, which is really about how air quality in the healthcare environment, including ambulatory settings, um, including like various different kinds of procedure rooms. And um, I, I don't know about long-term care settings if they have that there, but they certainly have like uh, most healthcare settings that you can think of in kind of the acute and ambulatory care. And look at what they say. One of the biggest ways to help calm dust is humidity. So granted, we just said, don't use a, a humidifier per se. And I, I still kind of agree with that. I wouldn't necessarily put a single stand humidifier on, but you can think about how you control humidity in a building. Um, and, and this is in the healthcare, the healthcare space, working with your maintenance staff to see if you can't get the humidity up, keeping those doors and windows closed, that sort of thing. In the community, it's a different, um, it's a different uh, um, issue. I would recommend looking at EPA air quality standards and, and advice on air quality for consumers. EPA can, it can sometimes be hard to find that information, but it is there. And they do a lot about how can you improve air quality in your home. Um, if, it's, if you're talking about individuals who have high risk conditions and situations, then I'd look at that from the perspective of, of a provider and talking with their, their medical provider to say, is there anything special that they need to do? Anything that they need to watch out for? There are some people we say, you know, if they're really immunocompromised, like they're undergoing chemotherapy, we say, don't garden, don't go out near the soil. If you're near a construction site, you know, you might wanna close the doors and windows, have your air conditioning on so that you get filtration and then keep a mask on when you go outside. And usually actually at this point when they're that ill, we're talking about respirators. But those are things I would discuss with like their clinician if you're working in the community setting. But for the healthcare setting, really just making your ventilation um, optimal based on current guidance is, is often the way to go. And that will include humidity and, and considerations of dirt and dust. The other thing I will say is just around your environment, and I know the, the American West is in a pretty severe drought right now, so this is hard, um, but often what we'll do if there's construction right next to a healthcare facility is request that water cannons be used over the construction dirt and dust as they're digging. That doesn't work in agriculture, I know. Um, but, uh, but something to consider if you're dealing with a construction project directly next to you or on your own campus. Uh, so ultimately, <laughs> it's, it's very hard to protect somebody completely from these pathogens. But those are the sorts of things that I would look at. Um, I see a question in, in the chat. Did anybody want to go off mute? Otherwise, Sarah, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I want to give people a chance if there's... Okay, UV drawers or boxes. So <laughs> jury's still out. So um, there is not evidence to suggest that they are of val more or less value. They're just, you know, this is an ongoing question. What I would say about UV is it doesn't take the place of anything, right? You have to clean and disinfect before you can UV, you can use UV on anything. Uh, organic matter generally um, will prevent the UV from working. So if you have residue of any sort, whether that's just oils or um, skin cells from the hands or uh, blood or what have you, that's, that's going to block the UV rays and it will make the UV less effective at killing any organisms that it might kill whether or not you get any advantage, any decreased infections from using UV, no one really has good data at this point to suggest that you do or you don't. Um, so that's something to consider as you consider the price tag of some of these UV um, interventions. There may be more cost-effective interventions out there right now with better data behind them. Um, and, uh, and so even though there's a lot of attention being paid to UV and UV in the air and air ducts for tuberculosis does have a lot of data. So if you're, if you're dealing with tuberculosis and you're thinking about UV for your air handling system, that's different. But if you're thinking about UV boxes and drawers for devices and things like that, the, the, the jury's still out. 
other questions? These are great questions, you guys. The UV robot, <laughs> same as the UV drawers. There is not good data, regardless of what the, what <laughs> regardless of what you're told about the data on it. There's no, there's no one way or the other. That's not to say that it doesn't work. You know, some of this is just there's no good data because people haven't gotten the data collected. But UV robots have um, a long history in healthcare. They've been studied since I was in medical school, and I think the the jury was out then. And ten years later, it is ten years, right? Twelve years. 12 years later, the jury's still out. Um, so I think, you know, the, uh, the only things I would say is be careful because UV can be harmful to the skin. So you wanna make sure you follow all the protocols to protect your workers and patients. Um, but other than that, you still have to completely clean and disinfect a room in the same way that you always do. And then you use the UV robot. The better your cleaning and disinfection are, the better a robot would theoretically work, UV would theoretically work. But again, there's really not evidence that it adds anything more than good cleaning and disinfection. Um, <laughs> a more user-friendly handout. I wish, Natalie, are you using list N? Yeah, I'm going through that list. It's like pages and pages. So I didn't know if there was a, a, a better um, so there is, and I don't off the top of my head know the exact website. I will try to think of it while others are talking or get it for you while the other, others are talking and put in the chat. There is a tool where you can, if you have a product, you can look up the EPA registration number and it will tell you whether it's on list N or not. Um, but for most, um, for most things, you will... Um, you'll just, you'll have to search that database. And I know it's a pain. I've been there, been there, done that. It is very hard to use, but they, I think they've made something, I think it's called like the list N tool that allows you to do a lookup. So you might want to try with that. Okay. Martin, Beth, does that help, Natalyn? Yeah, that does. I just was, we were doing a community, um, a community session, information session over Zoom and just going through some, um, Usually we teach about, you know, how to make your own household cleaners, but, you know, with this, we had to really shift it. And, and so we had a lot of questions about where to go for EPA approved um, things that you can find like at the dollar store, because that's where a lot of, you know, of our community gets their cleaning sure. product. So they're like fabulous. So it doesn't work, you know, but it smells delicious, but you know, things like that. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Shay. Thank you for putting the that in there. That's the the list end tool. Um, that is, I mean, that's what I use. It's hard with the community. The thing I would say to the community is that in order to really be, you know, proven to kill, they should have an EPA registration number on the back of the product. On the label of the product, there should be an EPA registration number. If there is not an EPA registration number on the back of the product, then it's not registered with the EPA as having antimicrobial properties, um, regardless of what, you know, the product says. Now, that doesn't mean the product doesn't work. It just means that it's not registered. They're technically registered as pesticides, actually. And so it's not registered as a pesticide with the EPA. So you want to make sure that at least it's trying to say, assuming it's not a counterfeit or misidentified product, that it is saying, I am registered with the EPA. You can then use that number to look up the, the product. Um, and if they can't find it, then it, you know, it's a counterfeit product or a misidentified product. Um, if they can find it, it should say on there what it, it works against and doesn't. Um, and that same thing goes, Martin, for healthcare. So a few other things for healthcare and EBS. Number one, your product should say on the label somewhere, for healthcare use, right? It should be approved for healthcare use. Uh, and that, that is different than the consumer space, which doesn't necessarily have a label, but when you're using a product in healthcare, in EBS, you wanna make sure that product is approved for use in healthcare, because it may have a different concentration, it may have different killing capabilities, 
Um, yeah, and then C. diff and TB, it should say on the label whether it works against C. diff and whether it works against TB. Um, however, EPA does have a list, list K is the list for C. diff. Um, and, uh, and when all else fails, a good concentration of bleach should work. Um, I believe the ratio in bleach is something like 10 to one or five to one, but there's a, there are instructions on the EPA website and also on CDC. Um, and many products will work against TB. I don't know if TB has its own list, my guess is they do. But if you're looking for TB, you know, as long as it says so on the label, then it works against that, that germ, or you can find it on the EPA website that that particular the germ is covered that um, it says it's for use in healthcare and that it's EPA registered. So you can find the product on the site. Those are the three things that you want to, to look for. I'd otherwise refer you to the environmental infection control guidelines, which do talk about this and talk about how to choose to some extent um, disinfectants. Obviously CDC can't recommend like a particular brand or a particular type but, um, but knowing that your product has been vetted by the EPA for what you want to use it for is the biggest part. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. Carlson. We are going a little bit over time, but I know there's a lot of great questions and a lot of great conversations going. So um, if there aren't any more questions right now for the presentations, um, we can go ahead and um, take a quick break here. We'll break for about 10 minutes and, um, and then come back for our next session of exploring the importance of infection control in tribal healthcare and how it is different from non-healthcare settings. And um, we'll also have some time later too, if, um, if there are other questions, um, Dr. Abby will still be with us and we can continue taking some of those questions later on too. So we're convening in about 10 minutes. While we're on break, please make sure that you are muted.
Okay, welcome back everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with the next presentation of the Tribal Infection Control Institute. Um, the importance of infection control in tribal health care. Again, thank you, Dr. Carlson and Kendra for the presentations in the, the first two sessions about Project Force Line and um, the infection control reservoirs and Okay, sorry about that. I am still getting a little bit freezing and a little bit slowness on my end, but just bear with me, please. Okay, so in this presentation, we're gonna talk about the basic concept of infection control and discuss the importance of infection control in tribal healthcare. And also we'll talk about how infection control in healthcare is different from non-healthcare settings. Okay, so what is infection control? The basic concept of infection control in healthcare is to prevent or stop the spread of infections. As Dr. Abby talked about earlier, germs are everywhere and they can be spread in many ways in, in the healthcare setting. And we also discuss the, the ways to stop germs from spreading in the multiple um, the reservoirs and um, each reservoir and transmissibility have different ways of controlling um, and stopping the spreads of spread of germs. Infection control measures are the things we do to prevent spreading germs that cause infection. The goal of taking infection control precautions is to keep people from getting sick. There are two tiers of recommended precautions in healthcare to prevent the spread of infections. And um, those are the standard precautions and the transmission-based precautions. Okay, first we'll talk about the standard precautions. So the standard precautions are the things that we use for all of patient care. And they're based on the risks in um, really basic co common sense um, practices, um, things like using personal protective equipment or your PPE um, that protects both um, healthcare providers and um, patients from spreading infection um, between patients or amongst each other. Um, and um, it stops the spread of infection from, or potential for spreading infection from patient to patient. So these are things like um, hand hygiene. We talked about that a lot today. And um, in the, the times when um, and hand hygiene is very important um, and regardless of the setting, um, patient care is being given or even outside of patient care. And, um, and we've talked about multiple um, PPE. So we talked about masks already and, um, and then using, using them whenever there's an, um, a potential for exposure um, or, expo or exposure to an infectious material. And also, uh, these are really the basic um, things that we do regardless of when there's either an unknown. Um, Dr. Abby also talked about um, we want to have the idea that we, we could potentially be exposed to um, to a germ when, while at work and taking care of patients. So these are the things that you'll do already. Okay. And then we have the trans transmission-based precautions. So these are additional precautions that, um, that can be taken when you're taking care of patients with a known or suspected of having infection and when there's an increased risk for contact of transmission transmitting um, germs. 
and um, some of the the things that we do in a transmission based precaution would be the, the um, things like um, patient placement. We talked about that, especially with COVID nineteen, and limiting the number of um, pay, uh, people in a waiting room or um, as a way of reducing the risk of having um, crowded space of people. And, um, and we may use an increase of, of PPE, like, like using the N95 masks versus the regular um, surgical masks. And also um, limiting um, the equipment in, in a room and they're um, limiting shared equipment um, where there is a potential for or higher risk of transmitting germs and not using a lot of shared equipment. Um, you want to have equipment specific to the patients that you're taking care of and also still prioritizing um, cleaning and disinfecting. We talked about that a lot as well. So having an increased frequency of cleaning the spaces or um, in a really focus on those high touch surfaces. And, and if you do have shared equipment, making sure that those are, are clean. Um, some additional examples of precautions that, that can be taken are droplet precautions. And those would be specific if, they, if there's a risk for respiratory infections and um, that for patients and um, in health, anywhere in a healthcare setting and where other precautions will be taken such as the additional PPE and um, limiting movement of patients. And another um, specific precaution that is an additional that can be used is airborne precautions. Um, the airborne precautions are for patients known or, or to be infected with um, airborne. So it's things like tuberculosis or measles or, or chicken pox are examples of um, things that be current that are transmitted through the air. And again, the airborne precautions may um, use additional PPE, um, just a higher level of PPE, or also um, implementing an isolation precaution. So we want to keep those patients away from um, if they're known to have that uh, one of those diseases, then we can keep them away from healthy patients really and um and any healthcare personnel who may be susceptible to contracting those type or disease or maybe at higher risk for um becoming infected or having having uh increased risk of becoming more sick if they were exposed or become um, sick. Okay, so now we um, briefly talked about the infection, what is infection control? And we talked a lot about already with Dr. Abby about the reservoirs and the, the risks for disease and recognizing the risks and how to prevent those infections. So why is in infection control important in tribal healthcare? Infection control can prevent the spread of infectious diseases and can keep tribal communities safe. And the benefits of infection control and in, in continuing um, practices that we know work for stopping this, the spread of infections within healthcare, um, we do these things to protect our tribal healthcare workers from getting sick. We do them to protect tribal members. We take care of from getting sick. And um, it's really 
important that we protect our elders. We take care of a lot of elders in our tribal health care, so we want to keep them from getting sick. And it also ensures a healthy future for our tribal youth. And um, some of the diseases that can be concerning in tribal health care are COVID-19. We're still um, still talking about COVID-19 and, and the effect on our tribal communities and um, continuing to use the precautions um, that are known to work for COVID-19, it will, will still be important. And, um, and some of the measures that were, were implemented because of the response of COVID-19 will still continue um, throughout beyond COVID-19. And we talked a little bit about the other respiratory infections that, um, that we may face and continue to face other than COVID-19. And I mentioned tuberculosis as well as the flu. We're going to, you know, flu season will come back again and everybody knows that. So we'll, um, we'll have the flu as well as things, um, maybe pneumonia and, um, also, healthcare acquired acquired infections. So those will be more are concerning um, in in hospital areas as well as outpatient areas. And um, we are learning from recent studies that are from a recent um, report on that American Indian and Alaska Natives are at a, also an increased risk for healthcare acquired infections. Um, and that was based on some reports, uh, pre really preliminary reports of the of actually coding reports. So billing reports showed that um, the one organization, actually two organizations, um, pulled some billing reports, and um, and it showed that what of the healthcare acquired infections that. Um, and they added the when adding the demographic information in that uh, that American Indians and Alaska Natives are at an increased risk. Um, it's very preliminary, and we aren't, don't know at this time um, the reason for the increased risks for healthcare required infections. I'm going to pause here and, and just ask a few questions. We can use the chat, uh, um, the chat feature and um, like to ask her what types of um, infection control measures that were implemented for COVID-19 will also um, continue even as we're moving, um, we're not out of the pandemic, but we're um, moving on from through the pandemic, what, what types of infection control measures will you use in your facility um, beyond the pandemic? Okay, thanks everybody. Sorry, Barry, for thank you for bearing with me too. I did lose my my little chat box for a minute there, and I'm um, seeing it now. So yes, Natalie. So the PPE and hand sanitizers and hand washing um, 
for public events. That's definitely something that's that we've talked about and um and we're continuing to be very vigilant with hand washing and um having hand washing stations throughout the community um as well is always going to be very important and um in the ventilation um we i think that's one thing throughout the pandemic that that as increase, you know, increased awareness of ventilation and um, is really going to be important moving forward to there's um, and yes, and, and continue to work on. So there's, you know, it's a very innovative field. So there, you know, there may be more technologies or, or new equipment that is being developed. Right, and then the communal communal foods um, potlucks and um, things like that, especially not only with the food and the shared spaces, but um, crowding may be some uh, concern as well. Especially if you're have if you have a potluck within, you know, a lot of <laughs> I've worked at a lot of clinics and and love to have potlucks and. Um, and we just really thank our staff and have, have a reason to celebrate when people are working so hard and taking care of patients. And um and, and having a potluck is always a good way to to um gather and and have fun at work. And um that's definitely something that we'll have to be a little more take a little more precautions maybe with limiting um or or using bigger spaces then and taking those things into consideration as well okay so the next question I have that we can also use in the chat, what are some other respiratory infections that um, may be of concern for, for tribal health care and things other than COVID-19? Do you want to share anything um, in your, your workplace or in your, your health care facility? Okay, so an increase in um, tuberculosis. So a lot of um, a lot of our tribal community members are um, you know, live in live in shared shared households or or, or experiencing homelessness and um, in communal living. Tuberculosis would be something to watch, and yes, in the flu and um, RSV. Right, so we're always going to have a flu season, and that, and um, for, throughout the pandemic, that's something that we we've, we've wa watched um, with flu and RSV. And all other COVID viruses and coxi. Right, smoking and COPD, um, or even asthma, maybe, um, because of a lot of the you know, NHB does a lot of work with with smoking cessation. So we're hoping that you know we can have some impact and and encourage people not to smoke. And um, COPD is also there's a lot of not even related to smoking with COPD, but there's other um, environmental risks for for people who maybe, um, I know when my tribe, we have a lot of, we live in the Pacific Northwest and um, a lot of people work on, on fishing boats. So it's a big um, tribal fisheries up that way. And a lot of people are exposed to other you know, poor air quality related to working on the boats and around engines and things like that too, that are, that there may be a risk. And, um, and Martin says, hantavirus, right? So we have a lot of um, 
specific um, viruses and that, that cause the infection um, that we may be exposed to in, um, in uh, around the you know, reservations, but it's really um, locality related. Um, yes, and air pollution due to the wildfires. Yes, we've seen a, a lot, a lot of uh, um, increase in the, the wildfires and, and the wildfire, um, wildfire season. And that's definitely a high risk areas. And a lot of our tribal members do go out and um, fight those fires. Okay, thank you. So let's, so the last question that I have is about the healthcare acquired infections. Um, I mentioned the, the, the report that I had, that I found on healthcare acquired infections. Um, for those who work in um, maybe hospital, large, do we have anybody from large hospitals or small hospitals who have seen an increase in um, HAIs? Or how would you um, how would you rate your concern for HAIs? Or is that um, is the I mean is the data available? Okay, so I'm not getting anything in the chat here. So that is something that we're going to want to, we'll be watching because we have um, in overall in the United States, there has been an increase in HAIs and, um, and during, during the pandemic. And we can share some information about that as well. And we'll maybe, add that to our discussion later this afternoon so we can um, see where that is in terms of tribal health care. Okay. And moving on. So now that we've talked about infection control in healthcare settings, let's talk about some of the non-healthcare places um, where taking infection control precautions may be important. Um, some of the non-healthcare settings that we can think of are at home. We wanna keep our families healthy and, and safe from infection, whether it's um, just going out and about through the day or um, if you're a healthcare worker and, and going home, we, we wanna keep our, our families safe at home, safe from infection. Um, in child care facilities, um, children can be more susceptible to getting sick. So um, stopping the spread of germs in health care or child care facilities um, helps to keep everyone healthy. And in schools, we want to keep kids safe and healthy. Um, now that we're back to school in person, I know it's coming up to the end of the school year, but when we're coming up to almost the full, full year for many year back to school, it's now more important than ever to, to think about the precautions that can be taken um, at schools. And also when using public transportation, a lot of tribal members depend on tribal transit systems to get to appointments or to get to work. Um, I know we've talked about um, the CHRs as well as you know, not, it's not just public transportation, but the CHRs do provide transportation for a lot of our tribal members to get to, 
to their appointments or sometimes other other areas throughout the the tribal organizations where they may have appointments or or tra need transportation home and we know that's a service that's often provided for the tribe um, on, on tribes and so that's another area where infection control is important. Okay. okay, sorry everyone, it takes me a couple of clicks before um, before my slides advance, so thank you for bearing with me. And let's see, so for this one, so let's talk about staying healthy at home. Um, as we go out and about throughout our day, there are many places that we can pick up germs, but you know, we could be out out in the community, we could be, um, whether we're the, we work in healthcare, we want to avoid bringing, bringing germs home. Um, we, we want to keep our families safe. And for this one, we are going to use the annotate button. If everybody can go to the top of your screen, and um, let's see, it's missing for me. And then in the bar, you'll see um, your options, your view options button. And then if you scroll down from there and use the, you'll see annotates. If somebody wants to volunteer and test that out, let's see if we can get something annotated on the screen here. Nice. So yeah, so we can I see um, we're writing and either text. So that's great. So let's go ahead and use that. If um, feel free to take yourself off mute if you're having trouble or or um, put it in the chat box if you're not able to find it. So what are some of the infection control measures that we use at home? How do we keep our families safe? How do we stop stop from bringing germs home with us? Yeah, so hand washing and hand there's hand washing again. So um that's also one that that we'll use at home as well as in, in our healthcare setting, um, right? And disinfecting, we're still going to disinfect the high touch surfaces when we're at home as well, and spray Lysol on all all the shoes and high touch areas. Yes, we have our um, the some of the sprays and disinfectants that we we use at home and. Right, clean, clean your groceries and wash foods and veggies. Yes, um, remove shoes at the door and cleaning and removing clothes from work separately. Right, those are some great ways. Um, Replace filters frequently so that the air filters. I'm thinking that's the air filters. Yes, yeah, so that's an. So we want it. We want our clean air at home as well. Um, what are some other ways? So what about um, not sharing personal items? So um, this was <laughs> this was one thing that was brought up at, at my house recently, and um, I know a lot of us. Uh, with kids will share the water bottle or you know that type of thing so that's something that we actually want to avoid doing is sharing sharing with each other i'm not sharing um 
towels or toothbrushes, those kinds of things. Okay. And what about, um, so what are some other environmental things that we might be concerned with? Control. Right, changing your mask after each use, right? We're still, we're still using masks at home now, and that's one of the things that we, before the pandemic, we did wasn't something that we always did. But the, what we do now, and it's important that our mask is um, working effectively, and we're um, changing it and um, after every use, if it's a disposable mask. And um, <clears throat> so what about our pets? So at home, we, you know, at home, we'd be more concerned of what our, our pets bedding or, um, or things like that. So that's um, something we would be concerned at, about at home that we, we wouldn't necessarily be concerned about at um, at work, and as I think we did mention, a, um, Dr. Abby mentioned a a pet at a VA facility. So that isn't always true, but there are some things. Okay, great. So all some great ideas and things to consider when we're at home. Okay. So what about in childcare facilities? Oops, let me clear. Okay, with my slowness, I'm wondering, um, uh -huh. thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so can you think of the infection control measures that may be important at childcare? I see cleaning toys, yes. Cleaning and using um, disinfectant, safe disinfectants on toys. Okay. What about what can parents do? What types of things can parents do for bringing their, their kiddos to child care. That may be important for infection control. Right, update um, immunizations. Yes, we wanna make sure that um, I know the Oh, it's also been study that kids um, have gotten behind on immunizations during the pandemic just because of um, not going, maybe not going to the clinic often or just um, parents not wanting to go to the clinic. Let's see, yes, stay home when they're sick and um, keep the kids home that, um, that's a really important one and check for symptoms, right? And then if you're, especially for the little one, the babies who can't always tell you how they feel, um, you, you do definitely wanna be checking, checking for symptoms of, you know, kids' symptoms before dropping them off and um, 
right? So to stay home and enforce the quarantine, right? And then and, um, that's been a big challenge um, because parents still have to go to work. That's why they're in childcare, but it is important to keep them home and keep them from spreading um, any germs that might cause infections for others, right? And diaper changing um, area protocols, right? And that's something um, to think about as, you know, as we're not only um, COVID symptoms, but other, other um, infections that can be spread in a, uh, in a child care facility. And what are some other things besides, what other things um, besides uh, respiratory illnesses um, can, what other symptoms can we, we check for that would be important in um, a child care facility? So a fever, yeah, so that, you know, fevers can, can be an indicator for um, many infections, not just respiratory infections. What about, um, we talked about the skin as a reservoir, so we want to check for anything um, like a cut or cuts or scrapes, um, sores. Um, anything like that, we will want to cover, cover that up, and that's, to prevent infection from, you know, skin infections. Okay, and then, um, and as a family and as parents, it is important to, um, to, Make sure that you're a good role model in using in your hand hygiene and encouraging kids to to learn, you know, even at a very young age to learn um, good hand hygiene or hand, hand washing and um, also, you know, ensure that they're 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 dressed in, in clean clothing and every, every day. So what are some things that the daycare staff can do? And child care staff can can do um, the child care facility that would be important for infection control. Can you think of any um, anything additional that the the child care um, facilities would look for? Right, up to date on immunizations. Yes, they would want to make sure. She's doing quite well. And David's taking three of those dogs. And remember, one of my dogs has cancer. And okay. right, and teaching um, teaching fun songs to um, kids to go along with um, for for good hand washing. Yeah, that's great. We want to make sure that the the kids are engaged in, um, in at their level. It's something that they can relate to as you know, a good song as a reminder. And um, also with staying home as well. We talked about staying home and um, keeping kids home when they're sick, but it's, it'll be important for um, childcare staff to stay home when they're sick as well. And then we already talked about keeping um, the, the clean toys. So any other, still any other high touch areas, um, keeping them clean. And, and also um, food safety too. So we, the kids are, when preparing, it's important to um, they, um, adhere to all the food safety guidelines because kids are eating at, at daycare too and not sharing um, personal or clothing items. Great, there's a lot of great information there. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to car seats, yes. <clears throat> 
that's an additional um, safety precaution. Okay, my button came back. So <laughs> let's talk about school. Um, so school attendance is it can be pretty challenging for for a lot of kids. And um, but what are some? We don't, you know, the, there's maybe other challenges present in in um, having good school attendance. But what are some of the uh, inf infection prevention measures we can take so that kids stay healthy and that they're not missing school because they're sick. Right, so even as, you know, from from the child care to um, elementary school and high school and the staff and adults, so immunizations is always going to, um, you know, make sure everybody's up to date on their immunizations and um, any vaccines and, and good nutrition, right? So um, eat healthy eating habits are, is going to be foundational and keeping um keeping everybody healthy and um have a better immune system to, for to not get sick and resting right and then i know there's a lot of um information out there about getting adequate rest for kids and oh, even all the way through high school i <laughs> i have a high school son and i know that he he does need a lot of rest to work really hard and um and need their need their rest to keep a healthy keep themselves healthy yes and at schools with the um disinfecting at schools and that's something that we've seen increased in um in well well during the pandemic and then, well, now that kids are back in school too, that's a big part of the plan for, for staying healthy in schools and routine physicals, right? Because um, you wanna know if there are any, any health issues that, um, that parents are, need to be concerned about as well. And eye care, correct? So, um, Eye care is important and um, important to watch for um, in changes. So, in hand washing, I think hand washing is going to be the, the a big one that we'll see throughout, um, whether we're in a healthcare setting in the school, at home. That's really an important part of um, protecting everybody and keeping everybody safe. And right, so be open with your child so that, you know, we're touching a little bit on just the having open communication and, um, and that's a big part of this, of what we can do as parents. Um, okay, and then, um, and I can still see people typing, so I'm kind of waiting until it comes up. Okay, so yeah, thanks. So that's um. So as as we're moving through these and um and coming up with a lot of things, we are seeing a lot of um similarities of infection control and um but there are some additional or things that we would be concerned about in in our community that we may not um be too concerned with that work it is oh so there's my oh i see okay 
So my slides, that was cool. My slides did get a little, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so we also talked about um, many people who are tribal members who may use the tribal transit system. And there's other forms of transportation. Now we're starting to travel more and um, people may be flying, hopefully taking a vacation. Um, and those who live in urban areas may also use the subway. And what are some ways to prevent picking up germs when using public transportation, whether it's flying or on the tribal transit systems or um, CHRs who, who provide transportation for our tribal members to get to appointments and in other tribal facilities, right? So using the masks, we'll continue to use masks and um, let's see. Oh yes, make the, the um, hand sanitizer available. So if you, yeah, I can see that especially with the um, with the CHRs and having that available in in your vehicle or right limit limit crowding uh, again. So we want to limit the number of people in a vehicle when making transports. Right, and routine cleaning. So then if it, you know, if it's a vehicle, then the, the cleaning is important um, within vehicles as well in trying to, to physical distance. Um, I think that would go along with the, the limiting the capacity of um, number of people and not eating in transport vehicles, right? Because then people are taking off their mask in um, in a smaller smaller space and using um, PPE for drivers, right? So, so what about flying? Are there Let's see vaccination requirements, right? So we want to make sure that everybody um, is getting their vaccinations and keeping those up to date. Okay, so um going along to and also going along with the limiting the capacity we do want to watch you know watch for people that we're sharing a ride with a bit you know if you're on a bus or in transport and if you see anybody who who looks sick then of course that's that's something that you want to avoid and maybe um not sit right next to them and and move to a different seat if you're able to and um yeah, so that will go along with the, the social distancing and, and seating placement. Um, also, what about just checking your space? So um, we talked about routine cleaning, but you also want to check your space to make sure there's no visible soiling or visible, you know, that's not visibly dirty before you sit down. And, um, you know, whether you're on a plane or a bus or any type of public transportation. What else? Are there any other? Okay, great. So I think we've covered as many as we can right now um, about public transportation. And go on to my next slide here. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so there's a little delay. So, um, so these are the references I have um, for, for uh, presentation here. And 
as you notice too, like I mentioned, there are a lot of things that are sim similar between healthcare settings and our non-healthcare settings for infection control. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot of things that may be different. You're gonna, the things that you're concerned with at home or, or out in the community that you may, may not necessarily apply to um, when in a healthcare setting. Um, Okay. Sorry, my screens are. Th Thank you for bearing with me. I do tend to have um some little quirks with my screen and and my buttons move around a little bit. But um, thank you for uh, attending this session here. Um, Courtney, how are we on time? Wow. Um, we have about 45 minutes. So I can briefly go over um, a few things and then we can just head directly into the chat session because we do want to make sure we get feedback from everyone and just discuss on okay. infection control. Great. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, everybody. We're going to move into the discussion portion of our institute now. So um, I can just, I guess, share a little bit of information and then we can go into um, our discussion questions if that works for everyone. Um, so our next session, we were really gonna talk about um, kind of moving from, I guess, crisis mode to a more um, non-crisis mode. We've heard a lot of people, a lot of states, a lot of, um, health departments, um, whether they're tribal health departments or non-tribal health departments talk about moving from a pandemic phase to an endemic phase and kind of what does that mean? And so we wanted to take some time, um, just have a discussion, um, see what you all are doing in regards to your infection control in your facilities. And so kind of to center us, I just wanted to um, just get, talk a little bit about what a pandemic is and what, and, endemic phase is. And so we know a pandemic as we've seen with COVID-19, sorry, my camera's off. As we've seen with COVID-19 um, is when a disease spreads rapidly and it's widespread. We've seen, you know, the entire world has been impacted by COVID-19. Oh, you can go to the next slide, slide sorry. Oh. Has been impacted by COVID-19. Um, we've seen, you know, at the very beginning, cases rose dramatically. Um, and over time, you know, with vaccines, um, mitigation efforts, you know, we saw people's mindset, we saw policies kind of switch more to an idea of how do we live with this. Um, so we're not technically in an endemic phase that has not been declared. But I do want to talk about um, a little bit about what endemic means. So when you are in that phase, it's more of, it's more stable. Um, hospital facilities are able to kind of manage the number of patients. Um, during this phase, you tend to shift out of crisis. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So there's a couple of dates that kind of are important as we talk about COVID-19 in tribal communities. Um, as we remember in March of 2020, that was when um, the WHO declared it was a pandemic. And once cases started showing up in the United States, we saw tribes were being impacted um, more so than other um, communities. And in 2020, there was CDC data to actually back that up and show what many of us already knew that American Indians and Alaskan Natives were at a higher risk of COVID-19 outcomes. You know, there were increased hospitalizations, increased infection rates. But also leading up to where we are now, I can go to the next slide. Um, some other important dates were the um, vaccines that became available. The first vaccine was Pfizer. We saw um, the FDA issued um, an emergency use authorization in December. Um, after that, uh, Moderna received an EUA. 
And then, you know, we came up on the year anniversary in 2021. And shortly after that year anniversary, the third vaccine became available, which was Johnson & Johnson. Um, also in 2021, we saw, you know, teens and children became eligible for the vaccine. Um, we saw boosters were recommended and people start getting their um, boosters, which brings us to 2022. Oh, you can go to the next slide, Carmen. Um, so one thing that stands out, 2022, um, according to CDC data, it was in February when the number of deaths um, related to COVID-19 among Ameri American Indian and Alaska Natives um, reached over 10,000, which is a very sobering number. And just a reminder of how devastating COVID-19 has been um, in tribal nations. It also reminds us that as the pandemic continues, we need to continue to remain vigilant. Tribal frontline workers are still you know, working hard to make sure their communities are being protected, are being safe. Um, when they come in for not only COVID care, but non-COVID care. And so that kind of brings me to a few questions that I wanted to ask and get feedback from you all on. What do you think um, you need to do differently once COVID is considered to be endemic? Will your practices change or will they remain the same? And you feel free to unmute yourselves or um, type in the chat box, either is fine. So we wait, I will. Continue a little bit. So during the pandemic, we noticed a lot of facilities were operating under crisis standards of care. Um, and when you talk about standards of care, there's kind of um, three levels to that. There's conventional, which is like our everyday standard of care. Um, we have contingency standards of care, which you kind of adjust, make adjustments to your everyday care. Um, and then there's the crisis level, which we saw during the pandemic where you are working and making decisions to, for the best outcome of all of the patients and not just one particular patient. So as we continue through the pandemic, I just wanted to know um, what you all have seen from the start of the pandemic to where we are now in regards to your infection control um, measures. Good afternoon. Thanks for this question. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting one in that much has changed. Uh, in the early part of the uh, pandemic, we really weren't sure exactly how to address it. But one of the things we did do is we started providing all of our positive cases and their families with cleaning supplies uh, glo uh, and gloves and masks and and we began to realize that um, this was a very important part of emphasizing to families um, while they were isolating at home that um, it was so important to keep the areas uh, clean. Uh, and we, we continue to do that um, now uh, with all of our positive patients. But I think what's happening is we're seeing a lot of people who are experiencing virus for the second time. So they had it early on and now they're getting it again. And we are beginning to see um, how important it was for, to, for us to educate and provide these cleaning and disinfectant and masks and gloves to families because now they're, uh, it's become part of what they do when they get sick. And so we don't need to intervene as much or support as much um, th this time around. And I think that's been something that um, has, has, has really given us uh, great satisfaction that that kind of health education could be done. The, the other aspect that I'll tell you about is thermometers. When we first started back in March of 2020 to address this, we would, uh, contact tracers would call people and they would ask them, you know, so do you have a fever? And many people would say things like, well, I felt warm or last night I had sweats. They weren't really using tools like a thermometer to be able to communicate with their contact tracers and healthcare providers. And so we distributed during, uh, up, up, till, up until today, about 2,400 thermometers, along with education on how to use it, when to use it, and what it means. And so we're beginning now to see the, the benefit of our doing that education back during the pandemic as we move into the more endemic 
phase and and people are just that m much more educated and able um, to self manage their health care. Oh, yes, thank you for sharing. Um, has anyone else done anything similar or different and found um, how that worked or how they switched up from the beginning to where we are now? Which Nancy, you mentioned a lot of good points. Oh, sorry, Natalie, I think someone unmuted. I can go. Um, yeah, I, I think in our community health programs, um, we went from, um, we, you know, of course we shut down and, and shut our programs down to the public and, you know, shifted over to a virtual delivery. And um, now that we're um, entering a new phase, our services are, are being offered in both um, hybrid and both well in hybrid mode. So both uh, an in-person and virtual and, and that's brought uh, more people to our, our programming, which is really great. Um, but I think we're always going to have that option of a virtual, um, of virtual access. Uh, I think that just opens up the, the gate and also, um, our, our in-person is really trying to, um, how we're trying to, uh, adjust our, um, the way we deliver services so that it can be, that can be delivered outside. So actually that's a really big shift for, um, our organization and, and creating um, like outdoor classrooms or outdoor um, spaces where we can meet with patients or clients and and not in you know in our offices or indoors. So it's actually like a, it's actually a really big organizational shift. So um, and and paying more attention to things like filters, how to keep our community safe. So while we are slowly, you know, um, going back into in person, it still is something that, you know, I, I definitely think our, our service, the way we provide services has forever changed. Thank you for sharing. Um, has anyone else um, started to see patients outside maybe or I know Carmen mentioned spacing them out. I know telework or telehealth has you know increased during COVID. So have you all implemented any of those to try to minimize um, infections? Well, some other questions that we've gotten and discussions that have come up in our other webinars or um, listening sessions and things of that nature was if we do um, move into an endemic phase or, you know, as a lot of places are easing up on some of their um, regulations around masking and gathering and things of that nature, and we start to relax those, can, um, can it get worse again? And so, you know, there is a possibility, you know, of um, COVID infections increasing once we see them decrease. Um, but there are, you know, additional measures and ways that, you know, frontline workers can help minimize that impact on their community um, at large. And a lot of those we've already talked about, such as hand hygiene, um, disinfecting, you know, surfaces in the uh, clinic and in the hospital facility, um, having staff be vaccinated, um, staying home if staff are sick. So are there other ways you think um, that maybe we haven't discussed or that you all have used or seen that have worked lessons learned um, to try to minimize um, those infections? And that can be COVID or it can be flu um, or some other um, illnesses that you've seen come in. To your uh, facilities. One big challenge that we have had is um, the challenge of isolation in homes where there are uh, where there is overcrowding of people, where homes uh, that were designed potentially 
uh, with two or three bedrooms for a specific amount of people. There are 16, 14, you know, 14, 16 people um, sharing this space. And so isolation becomes becomes very impractical and uh, very challenging. And so we as a community are beginning to try and address what to do in these circumstances and, and how to separate. Early on, uh, we were placing them in hotels, commercial hotels to separate the negatives and the positives. But after about six to eight months, commercial hotels began to see what was happening within the, across the nation, not just in our community. And so the availability of commercial hotel rooms uh, really dried up. And so we had to come up with some other uh, resources. Um, our local community uh, off of the reservation uh, set up hotels where they actually purchased or rented whole hotels and gave uh, people opportunities to go there to isolate. But that also had its limitations. You couldn't have medical needs. You, it couldn't be families. It was pretty much uh, you know, either single adults, it couldn't, uh, males or females. And so we, we now are working with our emergency management people to try and figure out when this happens, if it happens again, or if we should need isolation, how we might go about doing a better job at isolating uh, families that have large numbers of people in a, in a home. As we've heard that um, throughout, you know, the ongoing three years now, um, about isolation and quarantine being issues um, for different facilities and different communities about not being able to isolate due to multi-generational living. Um, so, you know, thank you for sharing what you've come across and how you are thinking about um, the future if there is an, another um, surge or instance where that has to be taken into account. Was there anyone else that wanted to share? Okay, well, I don't see anything in the chat box, oh, in the chat box or um, no one's unmuted. So we do have some other questions that we want to ask about um, your infection control practices um, and your lessons learned or challenges that you experienced um, since 2020. And so one that we've seen a lot of was um, workforce shortages are people taking on dual roles, are people stepping into that infection control um, leadership position that were maybe not in that role before. So I was just curious, um, do you all have like an infection preventionist or infection control officer on staff um, before the pandemic or did you um, end up having someone else kind of take on that role that maybe was not in that role um, to begin with? And are you pre like preparing for the future and making sure you have um, a staff take on that role? There, I see Nancy preparing for the future. So we have seen um, a couple people, they're starting to take some of the APIC courses or I'm um, starting to take the courses so they can become certified. Martin said, we had one depart at the beginning of the pandemic. Then over the course of the past two years, we had two contractors come in. The second one mentored him um, for a few months and then moved from a public health nurse role to an IP role. Just thank you for sharing. Yes, we've seen um, quite a few nurses taking on that dual role of um, kind of seeing patients, but also being that infection control person. Um, let's see. Natalie says she works for a nonprofit in an urban area. Um, they don't have an infection control staff. Um, but they're interested in increasing the capacity of their current uh, CHWs. Um, 
So um, in addition to potential workforce challenges, what other challenges did you all experience um, during COVID-19? Um, and how did you deal with those challenges? And are you still experiencing those? I, I think one of our biggest challenges is not having proper tools to collect data um, when you're you're trying to um, work a uh, an, a pandemic. Um, you're you're looking to get as much information as you can um, and store it so that you you understand what happened and and what has happened. And the tool um, certainly um, has not been readily available for us. Uh, to use in these cases, we've we've used some patchwork SharePoint kind of tools that we've kind of put together ourselves. But a real good tool to follow infection control, uh, communicable and infectious disease, would would be something that would be very very useful. Along with people who have good training in data collection, data analysis, and how to tell the story back to the community. Um, of what this data represents. Yes, yes, data has been um, a big issue um, and a, currently an ongoing issue. So yes, definitely. Um, Danita looks like a challenge they had. There was only two of them in their public health department um, and they had to take on the role quickly. She says, we were surprised that the lack of training the clinic had with infection control um, and they work for a small tribal clinic. Um, and then Martin mentioned um, there was a lack of nurses and the need during the pandemic. And it looks like, are you saying now you have lots of contact tracers and case managers as the pandemic went on? And that was how you dealt with that challenge? Or is that a continued challenge? That was a challenge during the pandemic um, hiring uh, enough contact tracers and case managers to provide services seven days a week. So a lot of people had to shift from nursing roles into contact tracing case management roles. And throughout the pandemic and now we are still very short on nurses. Thankfully now with the number of COVID cases um, very low relative to what it was, uh, we no longer have the challenge of the need for that huge cadre of contract contact tracers and case managers. So that's resolved, but we still are very short on nurses. A lot of people have left the workforce, it seems. Yes. Yes, some of the nurses, um, as you mentioned, um, that we've worked with over the course of the pandemic have moved from their nursing role to case management or um, some other um, role than what they were doing before the pandemic. So with that being said with, um, oh yes, public health nurses are difficult to find. Um, so with these challenges, and you know, this project is centered around infection control for um, travel frontline workers. And so we wanna know what type of guidance or trainings um, do you all need moving forward as we continue through this um, pandemic, as well as preparing for any future pandemics that may occur or disease outbreaks? So that can be guidance, trainings, resources, tools that you all need. A, a good data system. Uh, if we had a good system to collect data overall, mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, the state has one, but not all not all tribal nations um, work uh, with with those systems. Um, indigenous data is something that is a very important part of any community and having your own data systems that are designed specifically for tribal communities, uh, allowing them the opportunity to control the ownership of their own data, um, I think is, 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 is something that's very, very important for us to have. 
Um, it doesn't mean we won't share the data, of course, but it would be nice to be able to collect it and have it and analyze it ourselves and also have training and programming that allows people within the community um, to, to learn about data collection, to learn about public health. I mean, some people feel that all nurses are created equal, and that may be true in their licensing, but in their skill sets, they're, they're very different. So when I mentioned that public health nurses are hard to find, um, that's very true because public health nurses are not necessarily the same as a clinic nurse. There's, there's different skill sets that, that are there. And um, population health uh, and prevention um, are, are, are specific skill sets um, that are very important. Um, that it's not that they're better or worse than clinical skills, absolutely not. The two need to work together. But the, the bottom line is that I, I think that sometimes if somebody has an RN, they think that they can just place them pretty much anywhere and that they can function. And I think that there's some, some training gaps that, that need to happen. Uh, to uh, to make stronger public health presence in in a community so that they can understand more about prevention. Um, we have a comment in the chat box um, about a data system and someone to enter the data are ne is needed. Um, can anyone else share? Um, any gaps they've noticed that need to be filled in regards to resources or trainings, uh, guidance around infection control. You know, Dr. Abby did present quite a bit about the different reservoirs, blood, gut, skin um, devices. Do you see a need for some additional guidance around those reservoirs and sharing that, you know, with current infection control staff or those who are new to that role? Are you talking only about internal internal training or are you talking about um, interactions like with our community? Um, internal trainings, but if you have something else that's not for internal trainings, you know, please share that as well. Just trying to make sure that staff is up, to, uh, capacities built um, is kind of where we're looking at and seeing what staff may need. Um, I'll add something. Sorry. I think there's only, <laughs> I feel like I'm oh, over talking, but everyone's quiet. So um, I just wanted to, to say that we have um, working in infection control and, and trying to, you know, address that a lot of, a lot of it was at the beginning capacity. There were capacity issues. So those who were working in different areas in public health got brought into that. And I know that's, you know, a common that's common across Indian country um, in our in our programs that, hey, you were you're in this, so you know you're going to start working on this too with COVID, and so you were just kind of thrown into it, um, and and a lot of us have been, um, you know, the past few years, couple of years have been living in that world for a while. So I think it's nice too when you're talking about capacity building. You know, we have frontline staff that we're working like health educators, and, and I'm always going to talk about community uh, community health representatives, CHRs or CHWs, and, and you know, having those, um, it, we just have to use our, our frontline staff and really get them, um, you know, the training that they need to make sure that they understand this and they can relate it. Um, there's a lot of power in, in direct service staff that we, you know, so that's why I asked about that internal, you know, we, we talk like, what can we do for our staff? But really it's, um, you know, those who are really talking to our community and, and seeing them every day. Like I don't get to see people every day in like an administrative role, um, but like the CHRs, health, health educators, those, those staff are really out there every day and have good relationships with our community. So they should be getting more of this <clears throat> infection control so that they can talk um, you know, more and, and feel confident in sharing more about that um, with, their, with our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I wanna back up a second because um, we've had this conversation with um, some of our CDC partners who do you all consider frontline staff? Like what job, I guess job titles, what positions, what um, staff do you consider to be frontline staff workers? Because I know you've mentioned CHRs and uh, 
NCHWs, is there anybody else that you, I mean, outside of white physicians, nurses, that you consider frontline? Health educators. Mm -hmm. I, I know that this isn't um, um, always there. They're not always considered frontline, but our patient registrations, um, admin who are coming in direct contact with those in the front, um, like customer service staff are mm -hmm. always, are, are definitely considered that. Those who are working at um, vaccination clinics or testing, um, you know, drive-through clinics, testing clinics, those are all, um, those would be anybody who is, you know, who is seeing on a regular basis people from the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of comments in the chat box. Uh, we have educators, public health nurses, incident command responders, public health staff, cleaners and janitors, ancillary staff at field clinics are for VAX are testing, uh, EVS. And there's some other comments, um, jumping back to the previous question, sorry. Um, let's see, I'm a CHW at an urban nonprofit and we've had large challenges finding and retaining community health workers who have training. And when we do have people available, we often don't have funding for the extra positions we need. Um, another comment was communication within the community has been a great challenge. We have email, texting, Facebook, paper, and word of mouth but no comprehensive system that everyone can access. Um, so going back, sorry, jump, not to jump around, but going back to the different um, staff that are considered frontline, um, who do you feel is lacking um, resources that they may need or trainings that they may need in order to make sure they're keeping um, up to date on infection control practices that they are you know, prepared to continue as we move through the pandemic, as well as be prepared for any other outbreaks or things that may um, happen. Um, we know different communities have had to deal with a hantavirus outbreak or Rocky Mountain spotted fever outbreaks while also dealing with COVID-19. So what, um, what other type of resources or trainings guidance can we offer to help build that capacity with the, with the entire um, group of frontline workers from the janitors and cleaners to the public health staff to patient registration. Let's see, we have a comment in the chat box. EBS, patient registration, customer service are all under trained staff. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, let's see, we have non-clinical staff would benefit from training on when and how to use PPE. Thank you. CHRs, CHWs need continued training on everything from basic infection, disease control, to social determinants, public health. Um, do we have anyone from dental care or dental assistants that um, maybe want to speak to any training gaps that may exist there or first responders that may want to speak about different training needs or guidance needs? Um, another comment in the chat box was, we seem to have a lack of social workers during the pandemic. We had one who was very busy. Yes, we did um, have a few people mention um, behavioral health needs, which I will include the social workers in there around infection control and how um, they've been impacted uh, during the pandemic. And worrying about making sure, you know, patients were safe. Um, we have more mental and emotional support for frontline workers.
Hi, Courtney. So um, I just want to kind of piggyback on your question too um, about like, so it seems like there's, there, you know, we, we talked about before that there's a diverse um, staff in with various needs for training and infection control. Um, I'm interested to find out if the, what types of um, training materials would, you know, everybody's busy and, you know, still maybe still experiencing some short staff. Um, what types of materials would people, would you all be interested in um, having the staff complete? Um, you mentioned the CHRs definitely need it. What kind of um, training would be most effective for them? So there is a comment in the chat box that kind of a little bit speaks to that. Um, working as a dental assistant, I noticed most other assistants didn't have the proper PPE training to properly protect themselves. So kind of picking backing on Carmen, would that be a demonstration video that may be needed for those staff members on how to properly wear PPE? Would that be um, a mini virtual training that you can take that's self-paced? Or is it just a job aid or a poster you can post on the wall? Someone did mention toolkits in the chat box. I think there's so many different kinds of learners. I think all of those suggestions are a good idea because everybody learns so differently. Mm -hmm. Some other comments, there was psychological first aid, which goes back to the mental and emotional support for frontline workers. And then toolkits on preventing and managing burnout. So we only have about 10 minutes left. So I just want to know, um, is there anything else that we may not have touched on? that you all would like to discuss or questions that you all would like to ask, whether it's from Carmen or I or from Dr. Abby or from Kendra um, that you may not have gotten answered earlier that we can touch on before we uh, wrap up. Or if Dr. Abby has a question for the group, that's awesome. No, no, it's been very interesting to listening to listen into this discussion. And um, for those of you who, well, actually, I'll say one thing. From the Project First Line standpoint, anybody who walks into a healthcare facility for their work or walks into a healthcare space for their work is a frontline healthcare worker. Um, and that includes clerical staff, that includes dietary, that includes social work that includes contractors, that includes environmental services. So uh, we have a really broad definition of who a healthcare worker is. Um, and if you are walking into a healthcare building to where people go for care, or if you are part of an organization that provides clinical care, then you are a healthcare worker to, to us. Um, and so, uh, so that's kind of, that's where we come at it from. And I think, you know, when, when in even in technical guidance for the CDC, when you see people referring to healthcare workers, they truly do mean that whole group as frontline workers. Even if you're you feel like you're not, you feel like you're sitting in a back office. Um, that that's not the case for us. The other thing I was going to mention is you know for training, I think there's. Uh, so much that NIHB has done and is doing that uh, I'm excited to see. I know there is a lot of uh, CDC training available. Free training wise, Madeline, to go, um, to go at that, there's a number of things. If you're in a long-term care setting, um, CDC does have a, a full nursing home suite of, of infection control care that has been written and uh, it's not Project First Line, it's, but it's our, our division, uh, the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. 
CDC train is the place where you find that. It can be difficult to use, particularly if you wanna get CE, you have to sign up for two different systems. We're working to change that. But in the meantime, check out CDC train for trainings, both CDC trainings and trainings from other uh, states because states will put training uh, on that. Um, there are, and then all of the project first line trainings, we are eventually gonna come up with interactive modules, but we have a whole suite of videos that for better or worse are me talking to, to a group of people is, is how those are set up. And those are also on CDC train and people can get continuing education credits for those. And it walks through some very basic stuff. Um, this was from what we created during COVID and it's still on our website and I'll put that address in the chat here real quick. But um, it is things like PPE, things like how to do a user seal check on an N95, what source control is and how it works, things like what are viruses, right? So that people understand um, what, uh, what uh, we're talking about when we talk about a virus and COVID-19 and how things work. Oh, thank you, thank you, Courtney, for putting that on. Perfect. Um, and so all of these resources are really aimed at people with no microbiological or clinical background and so can be really used for anyone in the healthcare space. Uh, so please don't hesitate to use them. Uh, they're there for your taking, they're free and there's a bunch of slide sets that go with them. If you wanna be the one to lead a training, we have toolkits for that uh, and on and on and on. So. Uh, so those are our, our, our resources. We also, along with NIHB and others, do web trainings every so often. Uh, and so if you check in with Project First Line partners, uh, you may find that there's something geared towards your particular partner group. So um, those are all my pitches for please check out Project First Line because we have a lot of stuff for training. And it's all free. Um, paid for already. And so people are able to access it uh, as needed. And um, yes, don't hesitate to reach out to us through NIHB if, if there are things that you are interested in. The only caveat is Project First Line specifically focuses only in healthcare settings. So the non-healthcare settings are not part of Project First Line. Um, but that isn't to say that we don't wanna hear your, your interest in that, that too. And I know NIHB is working on that in other projects and in other ways. So um, I will stop there and please don't hesitate to ask more questions here. Um, so it looks like we have about five minutes left. Um, are there any additional questions or comments that anyone would like to make before we wrap up? I, mean, I do wanna mention um, Carmen and I, we did share quite a few links in the chat box. So we do suggest everyone take a look at those. Um, There's some links to the different um, parts of Project First Line that Dr. Abby mentioned like the videos and the different trainings that are available for CDC. Um, there's a link to CDC train um, to take some of those courses, um, as well as there's a link to the NIHB Project First Line page, which eventually that'll all be under the Infectious Disease Threat Hub that Carmen mentioned. So it'll be kind of a one-stop shop for Project First Line and then our other infection, infectious disease work, infection control work. Um, previously, there was a link to different APIC trainings. There's a four day intensive training, as well as um, a training for those that are new to infection control that was shared. Um, Dr. Abby also shared um, a toolkit link in the chat box. And we also want to encourage everyone to please complete the um, evaluation. We take those seriously. We, you know, definitely use your feedback that you give us when we create um, future job aids, when we create demonstration videos, when we create um, learning modules, when we determine topics for um, webinars or trainings. And so any feedback 
that you've given um, today are things that we will take into account as we work on future materials. Um, so please, please fill out that evaluation. We definitely use your feedback. I will now turn it back over to Carmen to um, wrap us up for the afternoon. And thank you again for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you for our presenters, Dr. Carlson and Kendra from the CDC. And um, I hope that you, everybody here um, like the Institute today. I know it's been a long day and full of information. And we, um, I'm glad that we gotten all the feedback that we, we've gotten and um, we're able to facilitate the, that conversation um, with learning more about infection control for the tribes and, and definitely uh, reach out to us. We've shared my contact information for the NIHB Project First Line where we you know, can always email me if anything comes up and, then, and we'll do what we can to address the needs um, for infection control for your healthcare facility. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that we are coming up at the end of our session. We do have other sessions um, this afternoon or this evening um, for the PPHS conference. So in about an hour, I believe, we have um, a, a dental presentation, a dental, dental institute, and um, we're glad that you joined. Please reach out to me with, with any infection control needs. Thank you.